Committee's 2022 meeting of the Energy Facility Siting Council to order. Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Marcy Grail. Here. Kent Al. Here. Hanley Jenkins. Here. Cindy Connell. Here. You have a poor amount of chair. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, are there any agenda modifications? Madam Chair, there are no agenda modifications at this time. Thank you. I have the following announcements. Please silence your cell phones. Those participating via phone or webinar, please mute your phone. And if you receive a phone call, please hang up from this call and dial back in after finishing your other call. For those signed up to the webinar, please do not broadcast your webcam. Reminder to Council and to anyone addressing the Council to please remember to state your full name clearly and not use the speakerphone feature as it will create feedback. For agenda item C, public comment period, there are three ways to let us know you are interested in providing comments to the Council. For those in person, please fill out a registration card, which is available on the table near the entrance and submit it to Nancy Hatch. For those using the WebEx, you will need to use the raise your hand feature. For those on the phone only, you will need to press star three, which will alert us that you want to speak. We will go over these options again during that agenda item. You may sign up for email notices by clicking the link on the agenda or the council webpage. You are also welcome to access the online mapping tool and any documents by visiting our website. Energy facilities council meetings shall be conducted in a respectful and courteous manner where everyone is allowed to state their positions at the appropriate times consistent with council rules and procedures. Willful, accusatory, offensive, insulting, threatening, insolent, or slanderous comments which disrupt the council meeting are not acceptable. Pursuant to Oregon Administrative Rule 345-011-0080, any person who engages in unacceptable conduct which disrupts the meeting may be expelled. Our first agenda item is the consent calendar, and we'll start with two votes regarding our uh, minutes. So the first one is a motion to approve, um, excuse me, we've done the approval of the minutes, um, and we're doing them separately, correct? I think probably, uh, Madam Chair, I think um, probably doing them separately would be best just because of the nature of the two different sets of minutes. Okay, and then um, Vice Chair. How I'm going to uh, excuse myself because I, as you all know, there are comments related to B to H, so I will not be participating in this vote. So am I allowed to just tee it up? Or? Okay. Yeah, I think you can, uh, Madam Chair, I think you can still probably run the vote um, and then I'll just mark that you recused yourself on the August meeting minutes. Okay, thank you. So um, council members, if anyone is interested in making a motion, on the minutes for uh, the first set, August 29th through 31st. Yeah, this is Hanley. Um, I'll go ahead and move that we approve August minutes um, as presented. This is Ken, I'll second. Thank you, we have a first and second. Are there any discussions? Hearing none, Mr. Secretary, please follow the roll. Ken Howe? Yes. Hanley Jenkins? Yes. Cindy Conn. Yes. <laughs> Motion carries, Madam Chair. Thank you. And if we could move on to the uh, minutes from September 27, 2022, if we can get a motion for that, please. Sure. This is Hanley. And um, I talked with Nancy yesterday about some scrivener's errors in those minutes, and I relayed those to her, and she's made those in her copy. And so I move that we approve the September 27, 2022 minutes as. Um, Recommended to Nancy with the changes. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, this is Kent, and I'll second that motion. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Madam Chair, uh, for the record, talk about it. Just one uh, or question before I've been in Paul Roll. So there was a B to H agenda item in uh, September, but that was not all the meeting. So do you want to go ahead and vote on that uh, set of minutes, or do you want to recuse yourself on that one as well? Um, I'm going to defer. I'd say recuse myself if it was in there. So I would like to recuse myself for both just to be consistent with what we've done. Okay. Thank you. So um, I will not be voting, but if there are no further questions or comments, um, Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Cindy Condon? Yes. Hanley Jenkins? Yes. Ken Howe? Yes. Motion carried, Madam Chair. Thank you. 
Yes. Yeah. Is there any issue with the green? Uh, I'm glad you asked that, that question. I was going to comment on that. So Please, Chair Howe. Um, so uh, Chair Grell had uh, asked that question yesterday. Okay. Um, so and we moved down uh, in 2021 through, uh, we proposed a bill to change the quorum from right. FSEC from five to four. Right. Um, because the quorum is four, uh, outside of uh, an, an application for a site certificate, which requires in statute four affirmative votes, uh, there is a table in the uh, uh, Attorney General's model rules uh, for public meetings, uh, and it sort of establishes, you know, that there's a quorum, you know, based upon a certain number of people, yeah. and there's a certain number of people present, yeah. um, the sort of a, a number that's needed to have affirmative votes to carry a motion. And so for a quorum or a council, a council body of seven with a quorum of four, with four present, three affirmatives um, count. Again, non, as long as it's not a site certificate, sure, it does count for every other type of vote. Yeah. Okay. It's a majority of the four. Right. Yes, it's a majority of the four. Good. Which, in this case, it's four. Thank you for that clarification. So, for the record, this is Chair Grail, and we, um, it's just important, I believe, that since I've recused myself for everything B to H, that yeah. even the minutes would be. Yes, Thank you. Um, uh, the next item is the county secretary report. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Todd Cornett. Um, First, uh, staffing update. So, as I had indicated during the last council meeting, uh, Tom Jackman uh, was hired to replace Christopher Clark uh, as the uh, operations and policy analyst three, which is effectively the rulemaking coordinator for council. Uh, Tom started on October 10th. Uh, unfortunately, he had a prearranged uh, vacation this week. So, he started the 10th, worked two weeks, uh, was, was on vacation this week, and then will return next week. Uh, and so we will have them available at the November council meeting, and we will have uh, an agenda item to appoint him, uh, propose to appoint him as the uh, official asset for meeting for it. So, excuse me, Madam Chair. Yes. Ms. Hanley, um, did he prepare the staff reports for the proposed rules? Mr. No. Yeah, we're, we are still transitioning. Um, so Chris is really still taking the lead. Uh, we will, we have a, a plan to transition, you know, the rulemaking responsibilities from Chris to Tom, and that's very helpful that we still have Chris on staff to be able to uh, finish out the projects that he's been working on and then help transition over to Tom. So uh, thus far, no, these are entirely uh, from Chris. Okay, thank you. And incredible. Double <laughs> <laughs> D. Uh, I have several project updates. Um, the first are for the three Shepherd's Flats facilities, Shepherd's Flat North, uh, South, and Central. So during last month's compliance update, um, we had provided you an update that um, the those facilities had all recently been repowered, uh, and it, there had been identified some setback issues with uh, two facilities or two of the turbines in Shepherd's Flat North, one on Shepherd's Flat South and one on Shepherd's Flat Central. So they had replaced the, the uh, blades in the cells and unfortunately had uh, entered into a required setback. So they were no longer in compliance uh, at that time. And so during that presentation, the issue had not been resolved yet. Since then, we have, uh, there has been a resolve. All, the, all the uh, wind turbines, the two uh, in Shepherd's Flat North and then the other two uh, for each of the facilities, uh, ultimately they swapped out the, the uh, turbine blades or shorter turbine blades that they had on site. And so uh, I can provide you the specific details of how much they were you know, entering into the setbacks and now how much did they meet the setbacks, but effectively all four that had previously no longer met the setback requirements now do because they had swapped out the blades on all of those four wind turbines. So as an observation, as I was driving down yesterday, um, I believe that's what I was looking at with Shepherd's Flat and the, the new blades are substantially longer than uh, the old blades. And there was one turbine that had the short blades and uh, I could see from the inner so you could see it. And it was remarkable the difference. Mm -hmm. the, 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 yeah. 
So, so just to clarify, I know you're only three were installed incorrectly. So the one at Shepherd South never received the longer blades. It was swapped out on the ground, only shorter blades. Two at North and one at Central. Got it. Set badge. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, like I said, I, I have more of the specifics. We obviously have expert in the audience too, and probably you can answer even better than I can. So, um, but that's the sort of the general is, you know, the, at least three uh, apparently were out of compliance and now they're in compliance. So, I, I, just my understanding of it. So, um, I think of uh, setback as distance this way as opposed to blades that go. This way, but the so, blades are turning. Yeah, and so the, oh, so they're reaching into the yeah. as they turn. Yeah, okay. so and it, and it probably depends on which way you know. Yeah. They, okay. All right. Right. They move around, and so if they are you know facing perpendicular to the setback, it's at that point yeah. where they would okay. be you know creating the inversion that setback okay. requirement. Okay, I meant to ask them last time, but thank you. Where the wind blows. <laughs> <laughs> Um, next is the state line wind uh, amendment determination request. So on October 11th, the department received uh, an amendment determination request related to the state line wind project. Uh, this project, which is located in New Mitchell County, consists of two operational units, state line one and two, uh, which that combined is actually uh, unit one and Van Sickle two, which is the unit two. Each of the units has separate LLCs, uh, limited liability corporations, as the site certificate holder. But both are owned by the same parent company, Nextera Energy Resources LLC. The Van Sickle unit, uh, which is the unit two, is currently being repowered uh, with new blades in the cells consistent with the council's approval of amendment number seven in July of this year. The amendment determination request proposes the wind facility components within the Van Sickle unit be reassigned from the current site certificate holder, which is FPL Energy State Line 2, incorporated to Van Sickle 2 Wind LLC without requiring an amendment because Nextera Energy Resources LLC, which is the parent company, will continue to retain control of both of the units, and in this case, particularly the Van Sickle 2 unit. So Oregon Administrative Rule 345-027-0400 requires that a site certificate trans requires a site certificate transfer if there has been a change in ownership possession or control of the facility or the certificate holder. According to the certificate holder and its parent company, there will be no such change because while the assets will be assigned to a new LLC and the new LLC will become the certificate holder, the parent company will retain ownership, possession, and control of the project and the certificate holder. So based on a review of this rule, the circumstances associated with the reassignment of the uh, unit from one LLC to another, and the written verification that Nextera Energy Resources LLC will continue to retain control of the sickle unit. The department agreed with the certificate holder and concluded on October 27th, yesterday, that an amendment was not required. So this determination was sent out by a courtesy email to our Click Dimensions email system to anybody who has signed up to receive that. And it was also forwarded to council members yesterday. So also importantly, per Oregon Administrative Rule 345-027-0357 sub 6, at the request of any member of the Energy Facility Siting Council, the department's determination must be referred to the council for concurrence, modification, or rejection. So just as a, there are two types of, two general types of amendment determination requests. The type A, type B. The type A, type B, um, only the certificate holder can request that be brought to council if they disagree with the department's determination. So for this type, um, it is essentially, you know, at the, uh, well, sure, the certificate holder could do it as well, but it's the, uh, if the council believes that they want to review, you know, the determination of the department, you may do that. And so, if you do want to have this brought up to the full council, um, please let us know within, you know, probably early next week, uh, and then we would add that to the November agenda. Yes, Cindy. Um, <laughs> thank you, Chair Girl. Uh, Cindy Condon. Um, so I, I got the email last night, and 
I have, I think, signed up for click dimensions, but I don't get it. So I'm going to have to get that strict squared away. And so I appreciate you sending, um, forwarding that. I, I guess I would like to look a little bit more into it or have the department look into it with respect to the, you know, once again, we're uh, considering the parent company as the ultimate responsibility, but I don't see that in the, you know, does the security instrument come from the parent company or the LLC? And so I'm somewhat uneasy with that. So I guess I'd like more uh, Patrick, do you feel comfortable kind of responding to that question? The security instrument is going to be updated, but it will name the new LLC to whom the assets have been assigned. And I haven't seen it, but I know that that is in the works. In Cindy Fine and again. And I guess in, in my mind that it is the LLC, not the parent company, that we should be relying on for their financial capability. So the financial statements for them. Do we have a comfort letter for the LLC, not for the parent company? I think of them as very different entities, and I know I've mentioned that before. So I'm still not comfortable with that. Uh, for the record, talk on it. So just sort of playing that out, uh, not comfortable in, would you like us to bring this to council in November so that you can evaluate and either, either agree or disagree uh, with the determination? Or would you just like a little more information before you make that? Probably a little bit more time to look at it. Um, and I, I just didn't have time last night or some more conversation. Sure. Um, with respect to what, what are the, um, where are the dots? Mm -hmm. uh, where do they connect? And right now I just don't, I see Mixer as the parent company. That's fine. But if they're not named as site certificate holder, they're nowhere else in the mix, really. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and just from a practical standpoint, um, so the November council meeting is the 17th and the 18th, um, and so because that is you know, earlier in the month because of the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, next Friday is the day deadline for the first round of packets. So, um, if you wanted to have this brought up to full council, uh, I did say November. Maybe okay. um, we, we, we may be able to do that, but it also may need to go to December because of, again, we're on a shorter time frame uh, for the next chance meeting. So again, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you shouldn't uh, request, you know, that evaluation, but I just want to be correct. So, okay. Todd, for the record, this is Marcy. So is it, I, I think I understand what Cindy's asking, but is it even something like if you got, uh, Delegate Patrick, but if you if there were something that you could identify to answer what you're saying, it may not be needed at all. So is that what we're looking at? Is that you're going to look and double check to make sure to be able to answer? And maybe we're looking at a placeholder. Um, and if more information is needed, then we'd say December so that everybody could do their full parts. Is that yeah, so Madam Chair, I think that's good. Um, so I think before you know, we, we don't need to do it on the record today, but before. Um, you know, you leave today, I think maybe we should have a conversation and I can write down like your specific questions so that we can then look into those and see if after we respond, you're comfortable with then staff's termination or if you're not, in which case then we will put it on either the November or the uh, December council agenda. Does that mean your need? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're sure you do. I think yeah. that's sensible. Uh, for the record, this is Marcy, and I, I can't help, I mean, we talk about it, that these things seem to happen, I and mean, it's business, and with all going on in the world, it's likely to continue happening, so if we could at least get some parameters and understand up front now, I'll probably save us all later. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Uh, next on my list is the Nolan Hills uh, project, um, and specifically related to the contested case. So, uh, following council's review of the Nolan Hills Wind Power Project at its July council meeting, the department issued the proposed order, taking into account all comments that were submitted on the record of the draft proposed order. During that time frame, uh, or during the time frame to request to participate in a contested case, the council appointed hearing officer received such a request from Umatilla County, who did not agree with the conclusion in the proposed order 
uh, related to Umatilla County's two mile setback requirement between wind turbines and residences. Uh, essentially, the determination was that it was not applicable substantive criteria uh, because it was not required by the land use goals. Uh, they disagreed with that, and that's essentially what their uh, request to participate in a contested case is about. So, as you'll recall, in the applicant's application, they asserted that the setback requirement was not applicable substantive criteria. So, based upon the applicant's assertion, the department evaluated that, came to the same conclusion, and agreed with them in the draft proposed order. And then during the DPO hearing, council also agreed with that um, on the record. Are they the only, this is Hannah, are they the only? Yes. For the party? Yeah, they're the only party. Um, so that's the, that's the nature of the contested case. And then on October 14th, the uh, council appointing hearing officer, Kate Triana, provided a status update email to council. Um, I forwarded that email to council on that same day, the 14th. Uh, in summary, the email stated that uh, she anticipates providing written updates to the council on this matter on or about the 15th of each month um, through the course of the contested case proceeding um, or on an as needed basis. And then on September 12th, she issued the notice of petitions to request the party status, uh, the order scheduling a pre hearing conference, and the pre hearing conference agenda. Then on October, on October 5th, 2022, the petitioner, uh, Uintah County, the applicant, and the Oregon Department of Energy, all through legal counsel, participated in a telephonic pre hearing conference regarding the petition on party status. Uh, and she will be issuing an order on that petition for party status uh, and, and the contested case issues as soon as practicable. And I believe we think that's maybe December. The next step is yeah, the order on, uh, she didn't state when. Okay. I would think we'd see it even before December. Okay. But yeah, first we'll say these are the parties, these are the issues. Then we'll have a pre-hearing conference uh, to talk about just how the contested case itself will proceed. And then she'll, that will result in case management order. So we'll keep counsel up to date, or she will keep counsel up to date through us on the status of the contested case. Actually, this is Hanley. Um, my recollection is that when we did the contested case on uh, B2H, we had the limited parties. Came, uh, we had to agree to the limited parties. Um, so will that, will her order come back to us for approval? Possibly. Uh, I believe that was because um, people were challenging right. and so you know, whether or not their issue was included or whether they were limited parties or not. So that right. was raised. So um, similarly, you know, depending upon her determination, even to the county would uh, bring that to council uh, if they disagree. But um, it's more likely we're just going to agree. It's probably, you know, I don't want to you know, presuppose anything, but because it's really one, one issue, one party, um, it, it's probably not nearly the, the complexity that the board would have anybody right. with. So it, it's possible, but uh, I would say a lot less likely. But I, I would agree that there was a, they actually raised two issues. The other issue that they raised was uh, the they had commented on the DPO that council should require the applicant to get a contingent conditional use permit. In the proposed order, the department did include a requirement saying you have to get a CUP from the county. Uh, during the pre hearing conference, the uh, county's attorney uh, stated that they interpret the requirement to get a CUP pop probably differently than how we interpret it, which is the CUP would include the setback requirement. Oh. So it's if you, however, the hearing officer resolves the first issue should take care of that second issue. But I was just pointing out that, and so the hearing officer, the next step as Todd has mentioned, will be to state issue an order stating these are the parties. It'll just be you know. The applicant to us in Newman Dill County. And these are the issues. So if anything, they might you might see them taking issue with how the hearing officer frames up the issues for the contested case. Yeah. Pretty this is Hamlet, I'm pretty familiar with 
the, uh, the concern they're raising about their CDP, but I think the statute's pretty clear. Okay, if there are no more questions on that, I will move on to the biennial energy report. Uh, so uh, the, Depart the Oregon Department of Energy's biennial energy report will be issued on November 1st. So this report is developed every even numbered year in advance of the long legislative session to inform local, state, regional, and federal energy policy development, energy planning, and energy investments. Uh, once that's issued on the 1st, I will send out a link to council members that will be posted on our website uh, along with prior biennial energy reports. However, if any council members uh, would like a paper copy, you can let me know, uh, and I will include that also in the, you know, when I send out the link, but if you want a paper copy, if you know now you want a paper copy, let me know and I will um, add you to the list. I can't say exactly when that production will occur, but we'll definitely make sure that you get a paper copy. For the record, this is Chair Grail, and I want, yes, I would like a paper copy. I have one, and I have dog-eared it. It's abused. Um, it's been very helpful in, um, in my a job to stop some of the rumors. I would also tell you that Christy and others have done a really good job of reaching out to people, um, and it's been extremely helpful to see. It's frustrating, I would say, uh, but it seems like so many more people are engaged in it now, so um, hats off to the department for the work that uh, is being done. Um, I will look forward to that birthday and present for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny Connor, I too would like a copy, and I, I have found it so useful. Great, I will, I will pass that along. I know there's a lot of effort that goes into this. We within the siting division, and, and, and usually mostly me, put put some time into it. Um, but really, it, it's it's a pretty huge effort, um, and I would say it just as you had said, it's a, it's a really great document. So, but I would pass that along to uh, to Director Benner and and others who are uh, you know more of spend a lot more time. <laughs> producing this thing. And, and if I might add, um, and I know Christy knows this, but the continuous turnover of the legislature, I can't help but think that the document is even more important as we continue to have these clean energy bills going to it. So um, I hope that people actually do use the resource as intended um, before they make decisions that are going to affect the fall. Uh, and last on my list are the future council meetings. So uh, November, uh, as I had mentioned, will be a little bit earlier uh, than typical because of Thanksgiving. So that'll be the 17th and the 18th. Uh, we will need both days. That will be at the Oxford Suites Hotel in Firmston. So uh, essentially the West End Solar Project, uh, which I think I actually failed to mention, I meant, meant to do that, we issued um two days ago the draft proposed order so the public hearing on the draft proposed order will be the evening of the 17th um at the oxford suite so that'll be 5 30 and then the regular council meeting will be friday uh, i don't believe it'll be a very long meeting so you know maybe uh, hopefully by early afternoon uh, will be concluded on friday then december dates in there. Let's see. December is also an earlier because of the holidays. So I believe that's the 22nd, 20, that's, what's the date? 15th and 16th or 27th? 15th and 16th. Okay. I believe, yeah, it's probably the 15th and 16th. So um, I think at this point we um, probably only need Friday, but we'll confirm that. Um, and likely uh, it won't be here, but we have to uh, draft the agenda and then send the draft agenda and the potential meeting location to Chair Rail for her review and approval first. But that's what I'm that's what I'm anticipating. Uh, I don't believe there's any uh, particular geographic driver of that meeting. And unless there are any questions from council members, that concludes my secretary report. Thank you. Any questions for Todd? All right. Well, then moving on to agenda item B, 
We have the protected area scenic resources and recreation standard rulemaking. This is council review of public comments and consideration of permanent rules. This is an action item. We have senior signing analyst and rules coordinator Christopher Clark prepared to address us. Good morning, Christopher. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Grail. Uh, for the record, this is Christopher Clark. I'm the council's rules coordinator. Um, <clears throat> I do want to um, make one clarification. Uh, we did put in this uh, that the council could be considering the adoption of permanent rules today. Uh, that's not what we're recommending. So I'll explain more uh, what our recommendation is in a minute, but I just want to uh, make it clear that, um, that that is an option, but uh, we, we have another option for you as well. Um, before I get to that, I'll be giving uh, some procedural and uh, procedural history and background on the project. I'll be giving a quick overview of what's in the proposed rules uh, that the council noticed on June 1st. Um, I'll be providing an overview of the public comments uh, that we received on those proposed rules and staff's recommended responses. Uh, and then we'll be asking you to consider our request, which is uh, to appoint a fiscal impact advisory committee uh, and issue an amended notice of well, and authorize staff to issue an amended notice of proposed rulemaking after we have that committee. Um, uh, so, just as as uh, I just discussed, um, this is kind of the end of this process. Um, but like other administrative processes, rulemaking is not always linear. Um, so, uh, if if the council does not agree with our recommendation, you could consider the adoption of proposed rules after. Uh, we go through all the public comments and you fully consider those and had any discussion you want. Um, we have presented an amended notice of proposed rulemaking with changes based on the comments that we uh, uh, previously received as part of your staff report. So if you wanted to go the other way, um, we would just uh, utilize that set of rules. Uh, but again, that, that is not our recommendation today. Um, uh, and I will go through this in a minute. Tell us as we go. Um, okay, so for background, uh, the council uh, must adopt standards for the siting of energy facilities, uh, including standards that address areas designated for protection by the state or federal government. Uh, that includes things like monuments, wilderness areas, wildlife refuges, scenic waterways, and similar areas. Uh, the council must adopt also adopt standards for impacts of the facility on recreation, scenic, and aesthetic values. Um, those are both uh, provided for in ORS 469-501. Um, the council has adopted three standards to address these things, the protected area standard, scenic resources standard, and the recreation standard. The protected areas and scenic resources standards were last updated in 2007. The recreation standard was last updated in 2002. Um, we started, I think, almost two years ago now, a project to uh, address issues related to those three standards. Uh, the objectives that we started with were to ensure that the standards clearly identify the resources and values those standards are intended to protect, to ensure that the standards are consistent with the siting policy in 469310, and to improve efficiency and effectiveness of the council's review processes and procedures by resolving ambiguity, lack of clarity, and inconsistency in the rules. Um, we are going on. Um, so we did start this in yeah October 2020. So I guess this has been going on for almost exactly two years. Um, we went through several rounds of uh, getting informal feedback. We had some rulemaking workshops uh, throughout the summer and fall of 2021. Uh, we came to you with our uh, preliminary analysis and recommendations in February of this year. Uh, went back for another round of informal advice uh, and then brought uh, our final draft of proposed rules to you in May. Uh, the council approved those proposed rules and we issued our notice of proposed rulemaking on June 1st. Um, there was a rulemaking hearing on June 23rd. Uh, and then a public comment period that extended through July. Um, we started the review of the public comments we received at that July meeting, um, and the council um, extended that review so we could look at some of the additional uh, policy and legal issues that were brought up in public comments. So that's what we're here to wrap up today. Um, great. Uh, okay, so that, that is kind of the background and the procedural history. Uh, what is actually in these proposed rules is that um, we've made some 
pretty substantial changes to the protected area standard um, and the associated information requirements that goes along with the protected area standard. Um, one of those changes would require an applicant to identify the managing agency of a protected area uh, within the applicable study or analysis area for the project, uh, as well as any reasonably available contact information for that manager uh, so that the department could provide a public notice uh, to that manager um, during the notice of event, uh, notice of intent phase and the application for site certificate phase and similar times when public notice is given during the amendment process. Um, the second change is that we would amend the standard to remove the specific effective date for protected area designations that's in there. Um, that date is currently May 11th, 2007. Um, so instead of updating it to today, our proposal was to eliminate that and say, whatever protected areas have been designated as of the date, that your application, your complete application is filed are the protected areas that you need to evaluate in your application. Um, and that would be those, that set is what the council would also be making findings on. Um, uh, the third change was to update and simplify the list of designations that are considered protected areas uh, and remove some of the specific laundry list examples. Uh, going along with this, we are working on a kind of publication that would provide more detail uh, to help uh, applicants and members of the public kind of actually find what those um, what those protected areas are. That's kind of in, in draft phase, but we're basically pointing to the information of where you can find you know the list of national parks in Oregon or uh, the list of wildlife areas, uh, wildlife areas or wilderness areas and that one. So. Um, uh, Finally, uh, we're making a, a small change to clarify the exception for when a linear facility uh, may be located within a protected area that's found within the standard. Um, for uh, the scenic resources standard, uh, we're making some really just clarifying changes uh, to require an assessment of visual impacts uh, to state scenic resources. That's something that already happens and we're just articulating in a rule uh, and making uh, clarifying changes to the exhibit R requirements that, that kind of go along with that. Um, as I'll mention later, we did get a lot of comments saying that uh, a lot of our stakeholders would like more specificity in the rules about what exactly uh, should be included in a visual impact assessment. Um, we've recommended and the council kind of agreed with us that that should be its own rulemaking uh, just because of the kind of technical and I think the technical level of detail needed to go into a visual impact assessment and a high level of interest in that topic. So um, that is something that we do intend to add to the rulemaking schedule for uh, the next the next update. Um, for scenic resources and recreation, um, we're also making a what, what we believe is an editorial change to just remove the reference to analysis areas. Um, in those standards, currently they, they only consider the impact to resources in the analysis area. Uh, and I think that's kind of putting the cart before the horse because the analysis area should be defined on the area of expected impacts, but that sh we do not believe that was intended to preclude uh, persons from providing evidence that there might be additional impacts outside of that. Um, so. You can discuss that more if you want, but that was that change. Um, and then we have a, just a few organizational changes, including moving the definition of protected areas uh, from the standard itself to the definitions rule in Division One. Um, and um, there is a administrative goalpost rule that would say these amended standards uh, also only apply to uh, applications that have not yet been deemed complete or not yet a like, complete. They're still in the preliminary application phase, I should say. They're, so the, the complete application has not yet been filed. Um, and that is uh, actually, I think, one of the, the big issues that I will be talking about today. Uh, a lot of people have some questions about that particular provision. Um, so at the hearing on June 23rd, uh, three persons appeared and provided a comment. There's a summary of what their testimony was in your staff report. Um, uh, on, and then as of the close of the comment period, uh, the council received 77 written comments. I've kind of summarized who those comments were from on this slide. I do want to note that the majority of them were from 
members of the public uh, through the every action platform. Some of those uh, comments are identical to each other, but a lot of those commenters that put in additional anecdotal evidence or reasons uh, why these rules are important to them. So um, you've all had a couple of months to look at this now, um, but I will try to go through and refresh what's in there as we go through this, this presentation. Okay, um, and for people listening in on the webinar, um, I did just want to uh, point out that all of the comments that we've received, uh, including a comment about a recommendation that we received last night, have been added to the citing docket, so they are available online. Okay, um, so as I mentioned at, at the July meeting, sorry, uh, the council did go through a number of issues. Those are up on the screen. Um, there was a recommendation that the council delay rulemaking. There was a recommendation that the council add additional applicability language to the uh, definitions rule and the information requirements rules. There was a recommendation that the council add uh, private lands under conservation easement to the list of protected areas. A recommendation to add the Columbia River Gorge Commission to the list of reviewing agencies. And a recommendation uh, to delete the provision, uh, I think related to um, pipelines in, in, oh no, uh, well, it's, it's one of the provisions implementing, uh, I think something similar to the balancing standard in the protected area standard. Uh, the council did not make any changes in response to these comments. I'm not planning on going over them again today, but if you do want to discuss any of them, I'm happy to do that. Um, Okay, and if not, I will just go ahead and move into um, the remaining comments. So, um, okay, so uh, the first comment I want to talk about was a uh, comment, and, and we received this comment in writing, and then we also received similar comments at the hearing from a different stakeholder. Um, the commenters raise objections to the fiscal impact statement that's included in the June 1 notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, particularly, they objected to the way we characterize the cost of compliance for small businesses. Um, for a little background, the Administrative Procedures Act does require a fiscal impact statement that includes a statement of cost of compliance uh, effect on small businesses. Um, there's some sub criteria that need to be included, including an estimate of the number of small businesses subject to the proposed rules, uh, a description of record keeping and administrative costs that would be required for compliance and uh, identification of equipment supplies labor and administrative uh, uh, administration required for compliance with the rules so our statement just said uh, no small businesses were expected to be uh, subject to the proposed rules um, that is partially because small businesses are defined as a corporation partnership a uh, sole proprietorship or other legal entity formed for the purpose of making a profit, which is independently owned and operated from all other businesses and which has 50 or fewer employees. We are aware of a, you know, a few entities that have applied for site certificates that do have 50 or fewer uh, employees, but we are not aware of any site certificate holder or other entity that intends to apply for a site certificate that is independently owned and operated from all other businesses. And partly that, that has to do with the issue of um, most of the time when we get an application, it's it's for a, a project-specific LLC that was formed specifically for that project, and it's almost always a subsidiary of another company. Um, the the, the uh, exception is, I think, when a certificate, it, the certificate holder is a utility um, or another power corporation, and those generally have more than 50 employees. Um, so we do believe that the fiscal impact statement is accurate, um, but we agree with the commenters that it could be more clearly articulated. Um, we have provided a revised uh, statement of uh, cost of compliance to small businesses in the amended notice that we've attached to the staff report. Um, but in order to respond to a objection to a fiscal impact statement, um, the APA requires an agency to appoint what is called a fiscal impact advisory committee 
there would be a group of uh, stakeholders that represents the interest in communities likely to be affected by the proposed rules that would discuss the potential fiscal and economic impacts of the, of the rules, uh, and particularly in this case, their effect on small businesses. Um, we think that uh, it would be prudent and responsive to the stakeholders to go ahead and have that committee. Um, and, uh, and then after the committee, uh, we're asking council authorize us to either uh, issue the amended notice as we propose it to you, or if we find that additional changes to the uh, fiscal impact statement are needed after the committee, um, we're asking your authorization to make those changes and then issue the notice before we come back to you. Um, I'll go over the details of what the timeline uh, and who we would invite to be on the committee are kind of towards the end of this presentation. Um, but if you have any questions about it now, I'd be happy to, to respond to those. Madam Chair, this is yes. me. So also in the staff report, you note that the two comment commenters did not raise their objections in the manner required by the statutes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, uh, the statute requires that a objection to a fiscal impact statement be provided within 14 days after issuance of the notice of proposed rulemaking. It requires the notice to be provided in writing to be specific about the basis for the objections and that it um, be sent to the address where comments are normally received. Um, the day before we issued our notice, we received a question from one stakeholder uh, about, you know, our presentation on the, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking, um, you know, asking why we thought no small businesses would be uh, affected. And we kind of had a, a correspondence there, but we did not understand that to be a formal objection. One, it was sent in before. Uh, before the notice was even issued um, to it was sent to me as a question. It wasn't sent to the rules coordinator. Um, so there is a there was quite a bit of ambiguity there. Um, you know, again, it was a question. It wasn't necessarily an objection. Uh, the the other comment that we received in writing was received on the last day of the public comment period, which was after the 14 day uh, period for objections had expired. So that's the reason why we um, also. The, the objection needs to be filed by either 15 or more persons or an association re representing 50 persons. The first, the first kind of informal questions or objections that we got were, were from an association with more than 50 members, but the second one was just from a single entity. So, uh, with, with, as they have stated, less than 15 employees. So, so that's that. That is the issue there. I mean, the council could. Decide that it's not necessary to respond to this, but, but we again would, would recommend that uh, just out of uh, out of both, I think, uh, consideration of the concerns raised and and you know the ability to reduce the possibility of procedural challenge that um, the, the safest best would be to go forward with the amended notice. So, Madam Chair, this is handmade. This question, I guess, is for Patrick. So, in order to um, deny the department's request for um, the fiscal evaluation, um, and one of the two commenters wanted to appeal that decision, what would be the process? They would appeal, and any rulemaking that the department does is automatically appealable to the Supreme Court. Their challenge would be that, as Chris has described, that the department's uh, rulemaking in this instance did not meet the requirements for the fiscal impact statement. And the response could be, as Chris has pointed out, that they were too late. Yeah, substantively. Yeah, they didn't meet the statute. Uh, so that that could be our response. But as Chris has also pointed out, they've raised concerns. There's still it's not procedurally airtight. Uh, our position, although it seems like we've had a pretty good position. Uh, I think, Chris, I know you're going to also be getting into uh, still other comments that were made, which is another reason why we would revisit this rule package. So as long as you're revisiting the rule package to address the other comments, then 
could also consider revisiting the fiscal impacts here. This is Marcy. So what I sometimes just wonder, we set an expectation that, oh, it's okay that you missed the deadline and then you know, you're okay, or is it literally just a matter of saying, we as council recognize this issue and we exercise our rights to address it? I don't want to create a problem trying to solve a problem or making it clear that you know we see it, we hear you, we're gonna address it, but is that gonna are we kicking the can of a problem later? Yes. This is handling. I don't do you expect an answer to that? I no, <laughs> thank you. No, thank you for that clarification. Those are just my thoughts. My, yeah. my concern is that um, I think the definition of small business is pretty clear. Uh, and uh, the department has made the decision that this rulemaking does not affect small business. So there's two issues here. It's one, uh, small business isn't being affected uh, by this rulemaking, and two, they didn't meet the statutory requirement for uh, raising the issue. Uh, and so uh, I guess I'm a little frustrated in that uh, we would go ahead and address this even though it hasn't, um, it, you know, it looks to me like a delay tactic uh, rather than actually addressing a real issue. And um, so I'm a little concerned that um, we would go ahead and continue the process for this issue, recognizing there are other issues. You know, I, I can understand those, but I'm a little reluctant to address this issue where we have two circumstances where it has not been met. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, one other sort of piece of feedback, um, you know, I think, you know, as we've articulated, council can decide whatever you want to do with this. Either you know, agree, you know, and kind of have the fiscal uh, impact advisory committee or not, and I think that's your choice. So the other thing is, um, you know, whether or not it's a delay tactic, you know, this could be used in future rulemakings. This is an also, also an opportunity to sort of perfect the model um, for us in terms of, you know, these arguments kind of get raised again um, to have a very good model to address those um, should they be raised again in future ones. So, you know, not only made it clean this one up um, and make it more <clears throat> airtight, but it could also, you know, provide us some value moving forward as well in future rulemakings. Yes, Cindy. Um, Cindy Condon, that I guess as thank you for that. And so 2002 and 2007, it's been a long time that since the last review. And so this guess is this will stand a long time. So for me, it's getting it right and maybe if it serves as a model. And we're going to continue our review given new comments. I'm curious how much time this adds to the I mean if it's that might be a delay tactic. What do we think it adds to the time? Um, I, I do have a timeline at the end of my presentation. We can sort of flip it through. I can just uh, tell you that. Uh, so we would we would need to have you know a committee meeting to discuss this, and then we would need enough time to revise and issue the amended notice, which should only be a few days. Um, so we think if we can get the Amended notice out by, I want to say November 18th. Um, we could have the 20 day required comment period for a fiscal impact about, for an amended notice and, and, and then get this back in front of you at the December meeting for your final decision. So for me, it's worth the time, I guess. So, and that staff feels it's, it's an important piece of the puzzle. So, Marcy, this is Hanley. Yes, Hanley. Uh, Todd, so what you want to try and refine is the fiscal impact analysis. Okay, so does that mean that in every case now you're going to appoint a committee? Uh, and what, what does that mean? So, that, so in this case, we didn't have a rulemaking advisory committee, and I'm going to tee that off to Chris okay. <laughs> for sort of a procedural explanation. Which he can do a lot of that. Okay. Yeah. The the opportunity for 
objection of a fiscal impact statement is only available when you don't appoint a rules rules advisory committee to well, develop don't. in the development of the proposed rules, or you do adopt an advisory committee, or you do appoint an advisory committee, and we don't ask them what the potential fiscal and economic impacts can be, which we usually do, which which is goes on every piece of paper I think that we give to a fiscal impact or to a regular fiscal advisory committee. So right. in this case, uh, it was during the pandemic. Instead of an advisory committee, we decided to have these workshops so we could just have whoever wanted to participate come. Um, but because of that, and, and we did actually ask the workshop participants about fiscal and economic impacts, but uh, because there wasn't a specific committee appointed, uh, you know, we, we think that the objection, uh, the the ability to object was there. Although, you know, as we said, we we, we don't know if anybody really did that in the way that. Which they understood. Yeah. I'm, I'm still concerned. It's just, but we're not going to get to a different conclusion than where we're at right now. Not by delaying the process. So we've been at this for two years. So if I could, I think maybe putting a pin in this question and coming back to it, because there's another one sure. as well, which also may. Um, Again, you can agree with or not, but may provide you a little more comfort in uh, sending out through December a final decision of these rules. Chris can kind of talk about that. And if we do that, then again, these are not necessarily have to be a package deal, but you know, there there would be no time lost for doing this if we did the other one. Yeah, I, I'm still concerned that you know we're addressing an issue that's not an issue. If I may, it's my understanding, at least that during the process up until now, this particular issue hasn't been really fully vetted. Is that fair, Chris? And the, the position that they're taking is that it will impact small businesses. It's been the department's conclusion for the reasons Chris explained that uh, it will not. And they're saying the department, you got it wrong. And this would give them an opportunity to explain why our conclusion is wrong to an extent that I think maybe they haven't really articulated so far in this process. Is that fair? Well, I would say the council did receive a rather lengthy comment on the grounds for the objections and why they thought small businesses would be affected and not really a good explanation of how um, the small business would be affected or what the potential mitigation uh, for those impacts could be. Um, so I think that would be one thing that a fiscal impact advisory committee meeting would give us, which would be, you know, if there were, were impacts to small businesses, there are ways to, you know, relieve uh, those small businesses of some of the administrative costs. Although I'm not sure that that's something that we can accomplish within, within these rules, but it would at least provide the opportunity for the stakeholders raising this issue to to provide that those suggestions. Yeah, so I'd say let's go on with the other issues. Sort of back. <clears throat> yeah, and just to echo, echo what Secretary Cornett said earlier, you know, my job here is to uh, provide you with your options and and a recommendation and the reasons for my recommendations. So this is your your decision. Okay. the The second really big issue, and this is one that came up in I think almost every comment that we received. Uh, well, not not almost every comment, but um, the vast majority of comments. Uh, and you can see these exhibit numbers. That I've listed on all these things are are <clears throat> tied to the index in your attachment two to your staff report, which includes all the comments. Um, so, and that is that in each of the three standards um, that we are proposing to amend, or that the council is proposing to amend, uh, the council has included uh, goalpost language uh, that, as I said before, uh, states that the amended standards would only apply to the review of applications and requests for amendment that are still in the preliminary request phase. Um, it would not apply to review of complete applications that the council's already received. So as an example, uh, the 
West End solar project. Uh, that application, complete application was filed in September. The council just issued, or the department just issued the DPO. Um, if you were to adopt these rules today, uh, they would not apply to the review of the VAT uh, project uh, or your final decision on that project. Um, part of the reason the council did that was to avoid uh, requiring applicants to go back in the process if they've already gotten to a certain point. And um, also, I think just based on the principle of kind of uh, avoiding unfair surprise of, of last minute changes. Um, uh, so the uh, issue, there's really two kind of sub issues contained in the commenters' objections. The first is like a policy consideration, just that the council shouldn't be applying an outdated review to any of its decisions, uh, even if that uh, would inconvenience the certificate holder. Um, I think you'll see throughout the comments that that uh, the commenters think that it's an issue of fairness that uh, you know to the public that decisions would be made on on rules that they see as outdated, um, and rules that we ourselves have, have, have kind of also agree are are outdated, and that's why we're amending them now. Um, the second and, and maybe more, um, I guess, meaty issue or or less discretionary issue is a legal issue. And that is that a lot of the commenters said that they believe that those goalpost provisions are uh, inconsistent with the requirements of ORS 469401 uh, section two. And that uh, section of statute requires that uh, any certificate holder require the council and the certificate holder to abide by local ordinances and state law and rules of the council in effect on the date of the site certificate or amended site certificate is executed. Um, and I think, uh, so as I understand it, and I will definitely uh, defer to your legal counsel if, if you have legal questions about this, but my understanding is that that statute is uh, really required or really intended to make it so if a new like environmental protection law or a new public health and safety law is passed between the time that the council or the department issues the project order and the council uh, makes its final decision um, and the council does not take the opportunity or, or the council or the department does not take the opportunity to amend the project order to bring that new law into the process and evaluate it. Um, it still requires the certificate holder in the council to abide by that law at the end of the process. So. Um, once the decision's made, the, the site certificate's executed, you can't just ignore something that happened in the meantime. Um, there is a carve out for local ordinances. Uh, those uh, local land use regulations are controlled by ORS 469504, and there is a, a goalpost in the statute that basically says uh, once the preliminary application is filed, um, you know, no new local ordinances. And that was, uh, I think, um, maybe I, don't, I won't. I won't uh, kind of uh, guess guess what the intent there was, but um, uh, that that is a separate issue. Um, so I think there is some ambiguity in what that statute means for the council standards. Um, those standards aren't something with an ongoing compliance requirement. Those are something that apply to you and your decisions. Um, so. Um, there is an implication that if the council changes its rules while a process is ongoing, um, that the council does need to apply those updated rules uh, to your decision at the end of the process. But that doesn't mean that you can't, within those rules, state how they will apply. So we think that the school post language, where you say the standard for complete applications on or after this date is the standard is, is the standard that was in effect when they started basically. Um, uh, the commenters disagree with that approach, um, but but that's kind of where the um, where the the thick of this is. I guess the, this is the weeds that that this issues. And um, I will say it is you know it is a, a difficult thing. It is an issue of, of statutory interpretation. 
Uh, I'm not sure I have a great answer on this. Um, we did provide both um, some additional language in the amended standard that would clarify that just because there's these goalposts, we do not believe the goalposts waive the obligation of the certificate holder or the council to abide by ordinances, state laws, or other rules of the council uh, that were in effect at the date the site certificate is executed. So basically, this is saying if there was a new, uh, a I'm trying to think of, of some protected area that's designated through law, and, and I will say this gets confusing because there's there's a goalpost issue with the designations themselves that I'll talk about next, but. Um, so if if there was a new uh so just, just as a clarification yeah. so probably the easiest way to think about this this particular point here could apply to any rule makings yeah so the the next one he's going to talk about is specific to protected areas so yeah. if that helps to kind of distinguish them um you know this would be kind of going back to my comment before you know we're looking for a, a same kind of model um should council want to do a goal post in you know a future rulemaking related to something entirely different than protected areas so this would be a general type of one whereas again yeah, the next one that chris is going to talk about is specific to the protected area designations yeah so to avoid my original place further i'll kind of stop there i will say so we we've recommended this additional language that basically clarifies, you know, this doesn't mean that um, that 469-401-2 does not apply. Uh, it still applies, and this is this is how. Um, the alternative would be you could just duplicate the entire existing standards in the rule under the school post section, so that it's it's extremely clear what standard you will be applying to those pending applications. Um, We've included that alternative text in the amended notice too. I will obviously only be going forward one of them, um, but that is a decision we, we'd look to you to make. So, Marcy, this is Henry. Go ahead, Henry. Coming from a land use planning background, I, I strongly believe in a complete application being the demarcation or application. Complete application is, you know, and I think that's fair to everyone. And um, so I, I strongly support the goalpost designation for a complete application. And uh, and I guess I'll leave it up to Patrick to tell us um, to talk a little bit about the alternatives. And why it might be necessary to list protected areas. Are you ready to move on to protected areas? Or? Uh, sure. Yeah. If you were done with this issue, we can we can move on to the, a, the similar issue related to protected areas. So, for the record, Todd, and Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think you have to make. The choice of option one and option two today, um, that still would be potentially at the, the December, if it comes back to December for the final decision. Well, if the council agrees with our recommendation to go out with this amended notice, um, you will have another opportunity to revise the proposed rules before they become permanent. Because there'll be more comments. Yeah, because of, there'll be another comment period. Um, and that comment period will be open to everything, uh, including this issue. Uh, um, we, we have received so many comments on this that I am hoping there are not new issues, but, you know, um, so, uh, this wouldn't be your final decision, but as far as what we put in the notice, you do have to make a decision about which way you think is, I would say, which way you think is the best way to go. Um, and then if you decide you want to go the other way later, you still can, but, um, we do need to put one or the other in. So we could not include both options, even if there was a preferred option that's articulated today. I would have to do some research on whether or not they actually allow you to uh, to do that. I, I I'm assuming the Secretary of State would reject okay. that. Um, because because that supposed be, to put your proposal forward. Because that would be an actual filing of notice of proposed rules, and so it actually has to be a 
a rule set that theoretically could be adopted as such. Yeah, that's so that would be cool options at that point. Okay. So I'll then correct myself. <laughs> so I do have to figure out which one you like better. Cindy? Um, Cindy Condon. So Kelly, I just want to make sure I understand what you're sure. Are you saying you're supportive of option two? Or do you not like what's in option one? No, I like option one because I think it's simpler and clearer. Option two repeats on um, the list and gets confusing. It, it was confusing to me the first time I read it. Yeah. Okay. But I'm, you know, I'm willing to understand uh, what is the best as far as legally goes. And I, I'd like to hear from Patrick as to why option two might be more legally sound uh, for the rulemaking. Uh, if that is the case, but I prefer. And just, just a uh, follow up question to you. So, um, this what is added here is intended to kind of uh, speak to the statute. Uh, and I'm just, I was wondering if the stat that statute isn't mentioned, and is that. Is there a reason for in this option, you know, um, if it's intended to draw attention that it's not in the, if the intention is that this statute still applies, but no reference to the statute. Oh, Council member Condon, um, I think it was just an editorial decision. We could add that reference if you, if you wanted. I'm just, I'm there it. was a process in the writing, so learning every day. Thank you. Um, and council members, I guess one one further just clarifying thing is that as soon as a decision is reached on whatever pending applications are out there, these sections would no longer be operable. They they go in effect. So the council could, I, whichever way you go, the next time we touch these rules, this section will be deleted. Of course, if we're making other substantive amendments, you may want to do another goal post. Um, Rule at that time, but uh, just just to know that you know these kind of have a short shelf life. Jennifer, yes, Ken. Coming from a land use background, as Councilor Jenkins stated, um, I too feel the goalpost issue is one that's based upon when an application is complete, um, and in that past background that I had. If there is a feds, the federal laws identify a new and endangered species or something like that, the developer has to comply with those federal, but that's not our jurisdiction. They gotta comply with them. Now, when it comes to this language here, where it says by by local ordinance and state and other rules that may change since the application was complete. Hmm. Um, It seems like if there's a local ordinance that's adopted, county code, we give them approval. And they, let's say it requires some addition of what I see CUP by county code that wasn't in there when the application was made and deemed complete. I have a little bit of confusion over how that gets implemented other than the applicant needs to take out a CUP with that county. But what's the, where's the hammer if they don't? So. Oh, sorry. I'm like <laughs> looking at you and I'm like waiting for you to come <laughs> to <laughs> Cliffhanger, sorry, secretary. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's, so I can kind of, uh, Rephrase that because it kind of brings up a question. Is there any contradiction in this language? Mm -hmm. So because so using local government is a good example. Because so the applicant chooses path B, which means that the you know the land use gets incorporated into the council's jurisdiction. Um, well, actually, maybe it's not land use is a good one because that already has a goal post rule. Um, right, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll say you know a uh, department of state lands you know uh, wetland issue. Um, that will get folded into the council's jurisdiction um, as part of our process. And so I guess, is there any contradiction in what the first part of this says versus what the second part? So it says, you know, it's essentially you know, 
required, you know, what's what's required is what was, you know, applicable on the date that the application was complete, but say then DSL does rulemaking, changes something um, that then is also already incorporated into our process. Is there any conflict between the second part, the underlying part, and then the first part? Secretary Cornett, I would say it is helpful to think about these clauses in context of the rules that they're a part of. So we'll say for protected areas, the standard is the council must find that the proposed facility, one, is you know, not in the boundaries of protected area, and two, uh, is uh, will not have a significant adverse impact on a protected area. Um, and the current rule is, you know, the protected area designated on or before May 11, 2007. Um, the, so the first part of this is just saying um, that is still the standard that the council will apply. Um, and all the details of what exactly those protected areas are is what will still apply when you make your decision. Um, but if there were a law, that said, you know, um, if, if, you know, if the legislature took action to say, well, there's this new, this whole new class of protected areas, and the law is that you cannot um, have any development in it, uh, then you know, there, this would not waive that law. Again, the local ordinance thing is weird. Uh, we've duplicated statutory language here, but there's been case law on what exactly that that statutory language means in the context. Of local land use regulation, um, I will uh, try to avoid <laughs> that conversation because I've read that case uh, a number of times and um, it makes sense, but there's like something about it that doesn't uh, click with my brain, so I just have to accept what they say. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so I think when you're saying we have a standard of approval, this is the standard we are going to apply when we decide whether or not to approve an application is different than saying, you know, there is a body of law out there that says what somebody can or cannot do. Um, in some cases, you, you are, your job is usually to determine compliance with those laws and rules um, and policies for protected areas. You know, you've gone a little farther and, and said, you know, we are actually going to consider this additional environmental impact analysis of protected areas that that isn't required in another law. Um, same with scenic resources and recreation, um, because those are things that the legislature told you you should evaluate the impacts on these these resources. Um, so you're just saying we're going to evaluate the impacts on those resources in a certain way, but you're not making a determination of compliance with other applicable laws. And I think that's the best way that I. Come to think about this. Yeah. Sure. Yes, Ken. So a light just went on in my head. Maybe this works, and maybe I'm wrong. Well, let me just hear me out for a second. So let's say, so mention the Milwaukee Hills as an example, or is it better to be general? So I'll be general. I would say what it would be fine if, as long as you don't talk about the you know the elements that are in the contested case. Okay, maybe. <laughs> so maybe. much for that one. I mean, is it, <laughs> is it, is it you can talk about Felix? Yeah. Okay. Same so let's say um, a turbine is cited, meets the local code, uh, setback requirements from a um, body of water. Uh, and let's say that distance is um, 100 feet. And let's say the state, DSL, comes out with a body of water set back that's statewide now, and it's 150 feet. Okay, we found that the uh, turbines uh, can be sited there. They meet all that, but the blade's too long to meet the new 50 foot additional setback. We've approved it under all the council standards, but we have this provision and nothing in this section waives the obligations of the certificate holder for complying with the local standard if it's or state law. Or state law. Um that's in let's say yeah. Certificate yeah is executed. So um 
So then they need to work with the state to show that they're not, a, uh, that's not really us they're going to be working with. We've given approval, they've got a site certificate, they can do it, but they need to go to the state and talk about how they're going to comply with the setback by making the blade shorter. Yeah, yes. Yes. Patrick Crow, this isn't requiring them to comply, it's saying our rule doesn't waive any obligation to right. otherwise right. have. Right. Right. Okay. So they could argue what we have for us for 69504 that has a goal post that says for land use requirements, we only have to comply with what's in place at the time of our application. They could argue in the instance you've described, yeah. at the time of our application, we only had the local 100 foot setback ordinance. We didn't have DSL. So because of 504, that's, we only have to comply with what was in place when we submitted our application. It's only the land use requirements that 504 carves out. If you don't consider protected areas to be land use, that would not be carved out and you would be required to comply with what's in place at the time the certificate is issued. And one thing I need to know that I want to point out, this rule that we're looking at here, is, and as you know, we should probably also look at the other rule, the preparatory language, the first paragraph, this one is only applying to where it says the council shall apply the version of this rule uh, before the effective date, right? So this this one, this is the one, Chris, that's intended to to apply to applications that are that have already been submitted but have not yet been approved. Is that right? Yeah. And complete applications that are complete applications. But not yet. Yeah. So we have another rule right, that exactly. would have, would would apply to Two years down the road, when there's not something in place, when these rules are taking effect, how would we address the same issue? So I just want to make sure you're understanding that's the context okay. of this rule. The point of that underlying language, nothing in this section waives the obligations, is as Chris has mentioned, is to say, look, we're not ignoring 469, 4012. We're not waiving if something else comes up still have to end it and it's not a land use, then you're still going to have to comply with it. Yeah. And sorry, one other thing is as long as I have the stage, Hanley, with, with regard to your question uh, about does it, should we just repeat everything that's in the current rule? I think this is a more succinct way of doing that where it says nothing. The council shall apply the version of this rule in fact, it may be 15, 2007. So it's, it is that, that when we refer to that, we're saying that's the version. So it's, it's right. the equivalent of just relisting the whole. It achieves the same thing without relisting the whole. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going with the wow over here. This is Marcy, that's a lot. <laughs> well, I, I think it's simpler, clear version of option one. I agree. Yeah, right, we will see in all the heads are not in the room, so we're all <laughs> on the same page on this. Okay. Can you do Yeah. Guess we need to wait. Yeah, there's another provision. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, so um yeah, I will so if we're ready to move on from this, we can put a pin on it and then um I will maybe rely on Secretary Cornette to remind me that we do need to have a decision uh, as part of the motion, but um, uh, we can definitely uh, table this for now and let it stew. Um, although the next issue is is almost identical, um, and it's just it's just that uh, in the protected area standard itself, and and I do want to comment that it, that any time it would be helpful for me to pull up the rule language, uh, I can do that. Um, but the protected area. Uh, um, standard as i mentioned the current standard says you know protected areas are are protected areas of national parks national monuments whatever designated on or before uh may 11 2007 um we would say well the proposed rules say let's eliminate that specific date and then do a similar goal post where it's protected areas that need to be considered in the council's evaluation 
are those um, established uh, on or before the date the complete application is filed. Um, uh, the comments on this issue were, I think that the issues raised were substantively identical to the issues raised in the last one. Um, the kind of, I think the, 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 um, operativeness of 469-4012 are, are like a little less clear now because protected areas are typically, you know, federal protected areas often are designated through an act of Congress that, that does become a new law, but, um, you are not necessarily making a determination of compliance with that law. You're just saying whether or not there's an environmental impact um, under your own standards. Again, um, there is. I think I think the the one just thing I'll highlight is that there we are aware of like one set of state laws, and it's around state scenic area or state scenic waterways that actually contains development standards within the law itself uh it has to do with what you can put and particularly what utility facilities can be built within like i think a quarter mile of a state scenic waterway um and those state scenic waterways are often a, a, a designated by the legislature so uh if you made your determination that um no state scenic waterways were impacted by the proposed facility, um, you know, and there was a new state scenic waterway designated, like, you know, the day after the proposed order came out. I, I think that is something that would be a very complicated, but very unlikely scenario that would happen. Um, so that that's just, I think the one hiccup we know of, typically though, like, there's no law really mandating what can be done in and around a state park. Uh, the state parks just have their management plans that applies to what the state will do with the land. Um, and there are requirements that the state has to adhere to when they are proposing development of, of state park owned lands or state, state owned lands, but they typically don't apply to the private lands around them. So there's not like a lot of, uh, I, I think the same sort of like legal murkiness that that I think the, the commenters are really concerned about. Um, it's just that one particular area around state scenic collaborators, which are um, obviously very important, but um, infrequently um, established. So, um, so I think we've kind of, uh, I think, um, well, I'm going to pull up the language here because I want to make sure that I'm saying the right thing. Uh, but I think we've recommended um, similar language. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, oh, no, but we, we did not add the, the additional nothing waves, the obligation uh, language here. Um, Yep, Ken. So the language is that the certificate holders are not deemed as having been applied. Does it happen after the site is the case? Is that then a compliance requirement that is part of FSAC? So it's the burden is on them to comply. Just yeah. like they would with the feds. Yeah, if the state, state agency or local subject to there. Okay. For the record, talk about it. I think that, you know, your, your first one, sort of like anything in the Species Act, you know, yeah. it is a good example yeah. because, you know, it, they still have to meet it at the federal level. Yeah. So the, we, we don't have any authority to say you don't have to meet these sort of federal requirements. Yeah. We're just not implementing them because they're not part of our requirements. And so, you know, it's. Yeah, that, that's where I think the distinction. So they're not all probably as clean as that, but that's probably a good way to think about it. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, and a, a good way to think about this too is that you know the council's decision of compliance with a particular state rule or local ordinance is a it's binding upon the state. Um, but if the council doesn't address something, you know, there's no there's not that protection. So um, if a new rule happened and you didn't address it in your decision, you didn't say you know we comply with this new DSL setback requirement, then there's no protection for the certificate holder. Um, and basically that becomes that's, between them and DSL to. Yeah, that's a yeah. good way to yeah. break it. There is no protection from FSEC. They've got to comply and, and work it out, DSL, whatever the state agency or local government is. Yeah, I think we can direct talk from that. I think just from a, just from a practical standpoint, you know, once you get to, you know, contested case and in that final order stage, you know, it's not that things couldn't get dealt with, it just gets really complicated about how do you handle then some new standard or requirement or criterion at that late stage in the process. Yeah, not impossible, but, but practically can be very difficult. Yeah. Well, and this is Canada. And one of the things that in land use is we're trying to provide certainty. And this is an area where in the uh, possibilities that something comes up after all the certainty has been given, they still got a deal. That seems like it. Okay. Um, I will. I'll go ahead and, and put a pin in this part of where we're good here. Um, so our recommendation is uh, same principles here, but we haven't added, added that additional language. Um, and, I don't think it's necessary, although people can also speak up if they're just not there. Um, okay, the next comment was that um, we had a commenter recommend that uh, information related to environmental justice considerations should be added to the information requirements for NOIs and applications. Um, and uh, the, sh the short version is, is we agree with that, and we do agree that environmental just that both that there is. Um, I don't think there's specific requirements for FSEC, but there is a general push for um, state agencies, including the Department of Energy, that are involved in uh, natural resource decisions, uh, to give greater weight to environmental justice considerations and to incorporate them into their processes in some way. Um, the uh, the department now has a seat on the environmental justice council and is working with that council to develop a mapping tool too to help identify um, where environmental justice communities are located in Oregon. Um, and, and that is something we are thinking about how to incorporate in our processes as well. Um, but um, while we agree with this, we do not um, believe that we can can put forward a rule now. Um, Partially because we haven't really talked to those environmental justice communities directly, haven't got their input on how we can best serve them or incorporate those considerations into the review process. Uh, and we do think doing so would really uh, go beyond the scope of just the three standards we're talking about here. So um, we think that this should be included in the council's big kind of application process review rulemaking, which is um, something that's uh, teed up and, and the department currently has a, a contractor doing some outreach on our internal program evaluation that is also getting some stakeholder input on uh, issues that are important to that rule making. So um, we don't recommend any changes to these proposed rules, but this is something that um, I think will be a recurring theme and probably most, most rule making proceedings going forward, um, or at least the big, uh, the big kind of uh, systemic overview rulemakings. For the record, this is Marcy Grill. I think each topic is going to continue, and I will definitely say until after the 2023 legislature meets, because it's coming from all spaces. I've seen numerous legislative concepts flying around, and I think we would be remiss to even attempt to get ahead of that right now. Additionally, I'm Curious to see what things continue coming from uh, the PUC as, uh, for example, the Citizens Utility Board just had 
their annual policy conference, and it was completely done by community driven um, action. So I would 100% say um, I'd be in favor of not even remotely attempting this. Wait till legislative to action. I mean, I realize we can't always wait because we never know how that's going to go, but there's a lot out there right now. I, I definitely don't think we should do it. Cindy? Um, sure, girl. Thank you. Cindy Conde. Um, I, I was struck by this, and I want to make sure my understanding, and I think you just said it, um, is correct. I was um, not surprised by the comment, but if we would consider that here, it would be under the protected, just this very limited and a broader and I was thinking well that would affect everything and so that's what I hear that will maybe oh, we'll certainly uh, take it up as an issue with rule making but after we have all the pieces and it would be broader than just three these three areas right Council Member Bennett that is that is correct that's what we're thank you Okay. Any other questions from the council on this issue? Okay. Um, okay, another comment was that there should be more accountability and transparency in the establishment of analysis areas, um, or conversely, that the, the use of analysis areas in the rules should be eliminated, uh, and the study areas that are established for the review uh, in the NOI should be used throughout the process. Um, we agree that there could be some more clarity and consistency uh, in the establish of, uh, establishment of analysis areas. In, in a lot of cases, those do just convert over. So when we have a study area, um, let's say 20 miles uh, from a protected area, that is just the, what we use um, for the analysis area as well. Um, we, you know, there are different ways of going about setting those. I think the um, the kind of section 106 process for cultural resources and archaeological resources has, you know, their methodology. I know um, we've seen some like estimated uh, distances uh, for like sage grouse habitat that the um, ODFW has incorporated into their habitat impacts quantification tool. Um, so there are kind of methods that you can use to estimate what the analysis area should be. Um, again, this is an issue that we think is. is broader than just these three standards um, and, and probably exceeds the scope of this rulemaking, but I think looking at how uh, and why analysis areas are established is something that uh, we could consider in the application process for review rulemaking. Yes, Todd. And for the record, Todd, on that, and just to, you know, this goes beyond this particular rulemaking, but the way that the system is currently designed is, you know, the notice of intent state you have these predefined study areas so that they have to go out a certain distance for a certain resource and those are just pre-established kind of based upon some safe harbor you know justification of when those rules were established the analysis areas can increase or decrease or increase or decrease in certain you know sort of areas so it doesn't all have to be uniform but the idea there is that you have more input more specific information through the notice of intent process based upon those study areas, based upon the comments that are submitted by the public, by the different reviewing agencies, to help then determine what those analysis areas should be uh, for that particular facility based upon those resources. So it's meant to be flexible. Now, you know, historically, you know, as Chris said, it's been sort of study area convertible to analysis area, but we do really try to reach out, particularly with the reviewing agencies to say, Here's the what the sort of base analysis area would be if it's converted over in the study area. Is that right? Should it be increased? Should it be decreased? And again, it's not even just a, you know, sort of a uniform sort of distance. You know, if you have an urban area on one side and a rural area on the other side, those can be different distances. So the whole concept is it gets perfected based upon the specific circumstances of that application and those particular resources. So again, that's just the, the sort of the methodology that's designed into the rules right now. Yeah, I think I think it's provide this is handling it provides direction to the applicant to uh, for the very specific application request that's being presented. So I I would be opposed to eliminating 
analysis areas. Yeah. The heads are all shaking. Yes, Christopher. All right. Thank you, council members. I think you should go. Um, I, so, uh, commenters recommended the removal of legal citations from the uh, revised definition of protected areas. So, actually, in response to the early comments, we kind of went through the definition and people were like, well, how do we know, you know, what a wilderness area is? And so, uh, we said, well, it's a wilderness area as provided in this federal law. Um, and we went through that exercise and added legal citations where we could to, um, as many of the different designations uh, that, that we could. So, um, some of the commenters said this is really unnecessary, and if the law changes or if they're renumbered, you know, you're going to have to update the rule again. Uh, you could be being overly specific, uh, which can cause its own set of problems. Um, we we kind of looked at this. Um, the the commenters also did point out a few errors uh, of citations, and, and we have corrected those. Um, but we didn't make a few other uh, changes. Um, I'll go ahead and pull up so you can kind of see what the um, what the scope of those changes are. Okay, so um, we've uh, again corrected. Uh, the reference for national monuments. Um, we've clarified kind of here that wilderness areas can be established under that federal law or by an act of Congress. Um, we've uh, um, added some additional detail to what exactly the special interest area are, since that seems to be an area of confusion. Um, and then corrected to these two, particularly there was, I think, a lot of concern about the way we had described uh, the legal authority for establishing state uh, wildlife refuges and fish hatcheries. So we've made those a little more generic. Um, but um, those, those are the changes that we've recommended in response to this comment about uh, legal citations. Um, Go ahead, Cindy. Um, thank you, Cindy Condon. Um, I'm just curious, just because this is up here right now, um, for the for uh, Q and agricultural experiment station, which you have no changes in, but established by Oregon State University. So, and and are actually references Oregon State University. Is there a possibility that another entity would another university, and they would not be in that system? Is, the way this is written, it's only Oregon State University. Is that right? Uh, Councilmember Khan, the way this is written, only the ones established by Oregon State University are considered protected areas. Um, and uh, this is this is another issue on our list, um, but I will I can I can explain now. Um, so, uh, Oregon State, as the kind of land grant university, does have specific statutory authorization to create these agricultural experiment stations. Um, so that's their uh, the research forests. Uh, there's not really um, well, they do have that specific authority, but there are other universities that have research forests. Uh, uh, and the one that we were able to identify is uh, the Rebarrow Research Forest in Eastern Oregon at Eastern Oregon University. Um, so it doesn't have the same sort of level of statutory backing, but it, it is a research force and they do do similar work there and it is managed for similar purposes. Um, the other kind of complicating factor is that, uh, I don't know, it's, I, I have family in Coos Bay, so I always uh, follow this issue pretty closely, but you know, the Elliott State Research Forest, the Elliott State Forest was recently converted um, to a research forest from a state forest that was managed for kind of multiple purposes. Um, uh, there was originally a proposal that this would become another OSU research forest, but uh, as it kind of evolved, um, the, the, what, what happened was that it remained in state ownership and is now managed by an independent agency. Um, OSU is still contracted to research, to, to do the research there, and, and they are the ones that have developed the management plan and um, the kind of research plan. So it is, in a lot of ways, 
a research forest that's being operated by OSU, but it's not established by them. So it's not clear if, if it would be included in the rule, or it likely would have been included in the rule as it's written. So. And that hits my question. It was the Elliott State for the, Okay, then I don't think that ended up in Oregon State University, so how would that? So thank you for that explanation. Um, with regards to that issue, um, we're not recommending changes now, but um, we will reach out to them um, either. Well, and I will say I've already have an email out uh, to them, but I haven't gotten a response back, so I'll, I'll follow up. But um, whether or not um, you know they feel like it would be appropriate to be included as a, a protected area, I think it would be a, a helpful piece of information for the council to have before you make a decision on whether or not to expand this uh, rule. Um, that could either be done uh, if we get a comment during this uh, amended notice comment period or um, you know, at some other time if the council, uh, uh, if, if we don't hear back from them before that time. But um, I would say the council uh, could also make that change now if, if you wanted to in response to the comment you received that this, this particular section will be expanded. I'm not curious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I uh, aim to so before you... that track, I guess. <laughs> Hanley. Yeah, but Christopher, this is Hanley. Um, so we have a list of federal land, federal lands designated uh, as, and then there's a list of items. So the word designated, does that mean that it needs to be included in some kind of federal land management plan? Or what do we mean by designated? Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Jenkins. Uh, so I pulled up that language here. Um, we we had it as a land designated in a federal management land management plan as one of these categories. Right. Um, currently, the rule says BLM lands. I think designated as one of these categories, except for E, um, which. That E is only plus the Forest Service. It was just what it was included before. Um, we the the comment was that uh, outstanding natural areas, I believe, in particular, um, can be designated through uh, an act of Congress or through some other way, rather than the administrative designation process that would end up being incorporated into a, a management plan. And if that happened outside of the like planning period, you know, the plan wouldn't necessarily reflect it. And so they just thought it would be more clear. The commenters thought it would be more clear to say uh, if it's federal land and it's it's designated as one of these, there's only really two ways for it to get designated that it's either designated through the administrative planning process and incorporated into the management plan for that land or designated by Congress. So they just wanted to account for both of those. I was wondering if we should say that rather than just say federal land designated, because that you know it's not very clear. Does that mean it's just a reference? And could it be just a reference in something? Um, I'm I'm concerned that yeah. we're not being clear about you know, what is federally designated. If, if I, this is, this is your choice. If you feel like it's not clear and you would like to switch it back, I think effectively, um, you know, they are equivalent in some ways, you know, I, I think it may be helpful to say if the rule just said an area of critical environmental concern, you know, would that be clear enough? And, and if so, then it almost doesn't really matter what the subheading here says. Um, I think, uh, but yeah, I think if, if you do think the other construction is more clear, you know, this is, you can switch it back, but, um, I think the operative word is designated and that means yeah, the process is what, what led me there was in E, it says special interest areas designated for scenic, uh, geologic panic. Um, so. My concern is that um, 
if it if it's not somehow designated through some kind of a management plan or an act of Congress, you know, a special interest area could be somebody's personal interest. Yeah, and that's why we added that additional language. But special interest area, it's capitalized as a like a, a, that is is the Forest Service equivalent to an ACDC, basically. It's the Forest Service equivalent to an area of critical environmental concern. Like they don't- Who knows, pardon me, this is last year, but who knows that? Um, so what? Well, Chris, is that a, that's a defined term? Yeah. It's so you put it in quotes, even more, get more clear? We can do that for every designation, but um, I, I personally feel like one of the reasons why we are offering to create this additional guidance is that, um, you know, basically a, a Forest Service designated recreation area uh, is, you know, more or less equivalent to a BLM designated area of environmental, uh, area of critical environmental concern designated for recreation purposes. So we just want those to be in, included, but like the special interest area designation includes all these sub designations. So we, we were trying to put the breadcrumbs to make it easier. Um, we could put a citation into the Forest Service manual that defines this, or the the federal uh, reg that that allows author like allows establishment of special interest areas. Um, yeah, in reality, I, I I don't personally think more specificity is needed because well, what, that, yeah. that's what led me back up to federal land designated. Um, in a federal land management plan or by statute that, yeah. you know, that covers all. That was kind of what yeah. we don't need to get specific in each one of these. If it's clear that it has to be uh, identified by the federal government in some kind of a land management plan that's gone through a review process and been approved. Um, so we could change. Uh, Subsection I, the heading to say land designated in a federal land management plan or by an act of Congress yeah. as with that. Yeah, that would be covered. And, so, yeah. and then that addresses all of those listed items. Uh, Excuse and, me, Cindy, does that work for you? I'm watching your face. <laughs> Um, it does, and it, it, again, I'm just not particularly familiar with this. Does would that cover all of the ways for the federal designation? You know, is, is it only a federal land management plan and oh. by Congress, or is there is there something? I don't know what the something else would be, but it, it'd be a shame, I guess, to say, oh, well, this is going to be really broad. It's all the federal designations, but missing this so the same you know for service blm for all of their management areas they have to have management plans and they have to be updated periodically and so my point here is it, it needs to be in that plan not somebody's concept yeah no and i'm and with you i'm there just as long as we, we don't make it to me this was pretty broad um and would catch everything um and when we limit it, is there would there be something missing from it, like a designation by some other so agency? Hy hypothetically, I, I think what you're saying is if like if there was some way for like the uh, forest supervisor to designate a special interest area with like the stroke of their pen or through an administrative order. Like outside of the regular planning process or planning update process, like w would that be covered? And and I, I will say I do not know if there is an additional mechanism, but I do know that it the the two kind of pathways that were brought up in our comments were the planning process and getting it in a, in a plan or or an act of Congress that establishes. National level resources. How about an executive order, a presidential executive order? Um, bears here, sir. Yeah. So for national monuments, that that is that is how they can be 
established. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I get yeah, that. That's a good question. I, I don't know if, if the president could order a forest, a national forest to designate an additional area or not. I don't, I don't have that answer to the question. It was just a family question. Yeah. My, my concern is that the federal land management plans go through a public process. Um, and um, outside of that, I mean, the public doesn't have the opportunity to participate. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's just that is left out. And so uh, we don't have to belabor it yet. Well, um, as a reminder, this is not. I, well, if you go along with staff's recommendation to have an amended notice, this is not the final. This is not the last chance to make these changes. Um, if you do want to adopt permanent rules, I mean, I guess this has a little higher stakes, but um, I'm comfortable with either construction, I think. So I, I think it's really the council's choice. Um, do you want to kind of take a straw poll now or do you want to um, wait till the end and, and Fine tune this a little bit more. Well, let's do it now so then we can be moving along and you guys are okay with that. Council's okay with that. Um, I'm going to say that I am going to defer to those of you who've done this for a living for uh, your careers because this is unfamiliar territory for me. So it makes sense to me, but I, I'm always, are we either missing something or are we opening ourselves up to something else? So I would ask. Um, Cindy just said this is not in her wheelhouse either. So if Ken or Hanley want to lead off any conversation, that'd be awesome. Well, this is Ken, and I like the language that Chris offered with land designated in the federal management plan or by an act of Congress. I think that gets the. I don't know whether we would continue on with such as and then list those things just so somebody has an idea of what that all includes, or whether you just stop at the, after an act of Congress. Yeah, I'm not opposed to the list, but yeah, five, five things that are listed there. Um, but I do think it should be clear that it's included someplace. Yeah. I like, the, excuse me, this is Marcy. I like the list because for somebody who didn't have a clue, you know, so I start right. reading and giving them some context to put it in. Yeah, but I, I will say the, the list is actually the important part of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, <laughs> it's definitely, it has it's to be one of those things. Yeah, because there are other designations that right. can be right. in a land yeah. management plan. I mean, it just it, it can be designated as timber management land or it's grazing land. You know, like want to include those things in there. Yeah. Um, okay, so these are the two options. Correct. Yeah, no, it's good. Yep. Okay, we are all nodding our heads. Yes. Okay, and I second option. I heard that. Okay, second option, and we're we're comfortable with the second option moving ahead. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Thanks for the clarifying. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't. Know. I didn't know if you wrap up. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for a healthy discussion. Um, okay, uh, and I can kind of go through these a little more quickly. Um, there was a recommendation to include uh, additional designations, including uh, all BLM lands with the char well, wild wilderness characteristics, potential wilderness areas. Uh, recommended wilderness areas and forest service inventory uh, roadless areas as protected areas. Um, this is a uh, basically a broad set of areas that were um, kind of, I think, identified during the 70s and 80s as like, do we want to expand these additional protections? out to these areas, a lot of them are still on the books. A lot of them require Congress to make a decision on them to be formally protected uh, or then to to have go through the formal planning process to be converted from kind of a potential wilderness to a uh, an actual wilderness. Uh, in some cases, the federal agencies do have management directives to preserve the wilderness characteristics to the greatest extent possible. but they are not 
uh, formally designated as protected areas. I don't know, as, as somebody who grew up in Western Oregon in the, the 90s, like I, I think I realized that this was a very controversial issue and whether or not these areas should be treated as wilderness areas for development purposes was, was uh, a pretty uh, controversial issue at that time and, and still is in a lot of places. So we're, we're not recommending that the council consider these as protected areas under your rule. Um, and, you know, that just leaves the management, what is appropriate management of these up to uh, the agencies that are responsible for it and um, not, not, not you. Sorry. Yes, Ken. I'm on board with that, with the staff recommendation. As someone who doesn't know a lot, I agree as well. Emily shaking his head, Cindy shaking her head, so there you go. So it's just sitting right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next is a similar uh, uh, recommendation to add all lands included in the National Landscape Conservation System as protected areas. Um, I've listed all the different kinds of lands that are included in the National Land uh, Landscape Conservation System. On this slide, uh, that includes a lot of things that are already considered protected areas, but uh, three things that are not. Um, in, in two of these, the council has already kind of addressed. Um, it includes any national scenic trail or National Historic Trail designated as a component of the National Trail System. Um, the Council, we did think about this issue when we were proposing these rules, and the concern is that there's National Trail corridors designated that include a mix of uh, federal and state public lands as well as private lands that are not protected, and a National Scenic Trail or Historic Trail as part of the National Landscape Conservation System only includes those parts that are within um, within federal land or managed by a federal agency. So, and in this case, managed by the BLM. Um, because it's pretty confusing and because the trail segments are normally incorporated into an, an area of critical environmental concern or some other protected area, um, we did not think it, we thought it would be maybe overly confusing uh, and, and probably an area that would be uh, and we could get it if we included national or senior trails into the protected area standard. Those resources are still, you know, would likely be evaluated under the recreation standard if there was a, a um, or or another standard even, uh, depending on the nature of the destination. Um, so we're not recommending the council include those. Um, the Steens Mountain Cooperative Management and Protection Area. Um, the council had a, a petition to add that to the protected area standard back in, I think, 2010 or 20, 2009. Um, at, at that time, the council reviewed the request and decided that since the cooperative management part of Steens Mountain, um, there were commitments by the federal government that development would be uh, precluded on the private in holdings that are, or private holdings, I guess, that are incorporated within the boundary. Uh, of the CMPA, but um, you know, are not managed by the BLM. Um, those would still be available for energy development, including uh, renewable energy development. In particular, that that should not be included as a protected area under the council's standard. Um, assuming that those decisions are still good, uh, we wouldn't want to move forward with this comment as recommended. Um, I did want to highlight one designation on here, which is a national conservation area. Um, there are none of those in Oregon, so it's not something we necessarily need to address. There could be one in the future, but um, that would need to occur through um, uh, a formal designation process at, at some level. Um, the one that is close to Oregon is called the Morley Nelson Snake River Birds of Prey. National Conservation Area. It's just south of Boise, uh, and it's about 25 miles from the Oregon border. Um, there, you know, if a wind facility was sited right at the border, and you know the council wanted to consider an impact, you know the council would need to amend the rule to incorporate this, but. 
that is very unlikely in part because the area of Oregon right along the border here is, is high density safe trails habitat. So I don't, I mean, if we had a proposal for a facility there, we'd be dealing with a lot of other issues as well. So um, uh, this is just a note. I we're, we're not recommending any changes, but I did want to just highlight that there was this one kind of uh, area where you know the council could make a change if you wanted to be uh, more inclusive. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, we've already talked about this, but yeah, we did have a comment to include all state research forests as protected areas instead of just the research forest established by OSU. Um, it sounds like council's okay with not making that change at this time, but we'll look into it further. Um, oh, and here's just a map of the different uh, research for forests we're aware of. Of course, the, the one in the middle is McDonald Dunn uh, Forest near Corvallis that is included. Uh, the Elliott State Research Forest on the left is not, oh, or is kind of in a weird, weird, weird position. Uh, and then the Rebarrow Research Forest, which this map is not very clear, but um, you can see kind of this. this Purple area near Lickerand is where Rebar is. And Cindy Connor, and that's Eastern Oregon. Yeah, it was the exact. Um, okay, uh, we got a comment to designate all critical habitat designated uh, pursuant to the Federal Endangered Species Act as protected areas. Um, we the council currently does not uh, review for compliance with the federal endangered species act under the fish and wildlife habitat or the Fair and endangered species standard um, uh, you know that that could come into the fish and wildlife habitat standard and i think a critical area designation you know was something that odfw may may be considering when they're designating habitat uh, although i'm not 100 percent sure on that so um uh and in addition, those designations are only meant to affect uh, federal actions, and they're not meant to apply to private land unless there's a federal nexus. And um, you've all probably heard about when there's a federal nexus in our, our project before, so that would be reviewed by a federal agency if, if there was one. So we're not recommending this change. Um, again, the kind of consideration of ecological values and habitat values under the protected area standard is still a question that's open and, and something we uh, recommend the council continue to think about when we do future rulemaking. Um, commenters recommend replacing the terms practical and, oh, using the terms practical and not practical in lieu of reasonable and suitable uh, and rules requiring the study of alternate routes. Um, uh, all these rule, those terms appear throughout. Um, the commenters specifically prefer the terms practicable and not practicable because there's federal uh, federal case law around the National Environmental Policy Act that uh, that that define exactly what those terms mean. Um, but that case law is not necessarily relevant to the council's decisions or binding at least. Um, so uh, we're not sure that that making the change would be any more. Clear, but this is really, I think, uh, I think that's the council if you do want to change. This is Marcy, and I don't know that I want to have a legal discussion about are these life words and what they mean and open up a whole new thing. So I would say no, but I would ask everyone else. I see heads moving, but so we agree with you. Yep. Certainly on the recommendation. You know. I think an ongoing review just for consistency might be helpful. Yeah, and, and so with this application process review and some of the other rulemakings, we are doing a more comprehensive look. And, and so I think looking at using consistent language uh, is, is, a, is a priority there just because you know, these are these are the things that can be really long and drawn out for you. Get a lot of attention. Okay, and then uh, I, I think I already spoke to ecological values. Um, we had this comment 
about adding interstate, by state, regional plans to the list of land management plans to be reviewed under the scenic resources standard. We've gone back and forth on this. Um, I, I think the real pain point here is that uh, uh, stakeholders really want to make sure that the 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 Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area Management Plan is is something that has to be considered when identifying scenic resources uh, near that that area. Um, we think it would be under the way that the rule is already written because it's a plan adopted by by more than one state. Um, but apparently the commenters did, did not feel that that was sufficient. Um, and this comment, I think, came from both the Gorge Commission and from Columbia River Keeper and that, that group. Um, we think adding regional uh, to the definition would would help um, just clarify that it includes a regional plan. The, the concern has been that that could also bring in like, uh, like Metro, which is a regional body within Oregon, but because that's a, a local government agency that, that covers more than one county, you know, we also think that, that probably should be included if there was an energy facility proposed uh, under and kind of within Metro's jurisdiction. So, uh, the term regional is a little ambiguous, but we think in this way, you know, even the more expansive definition is is okay. So, um, uh, this our proposal is to add the word regional. Well, I'm not opposed to saying I'm not opposed to adding region, but I think it's already covered. Yeah, it's more local. I agree. This can't, and I was thinking, you know, under the previous language we were talking about it, land designating a federal management plan by an act of Congress. That would get it. Yeah. Already. Yeah. So the. It's already there. The it's already part. Plan uh, the scenic gorge plan act of Congress. Then. Yeah. And the national, this is, we are now talking about the scenic resources standard, and the scenic area is also a protected area yeah. uh, because of the language that you used. Okay. I don't know that the region picks up something that, we, that shouldn't be, so I think that'd be the only reason not to have it in there. Yeah, and our, our evaluation was that um, it, it would, it would, Likely be the local regional plans, but I don't necessarily know that those are intended to be. I don't think they're intended to be excluded, so I don't think that's proper. Works. Thank you, council members. Um, there was a uh, change to the way that uh, the information requirements for the scenic resources standard was written um, that said that we we would uh, replace the current requirement for citing applicants to identify visual impacts of facility structures or plumes with a requirement to say changes in landscape character or quality uh, due to facility structures of uh, structures or plumes um, the commenters thought this was overly limiting and and we agree and are recommending that the proposal would be modified back consistent with what the comments was recommended so that when it talks about visual impacts uh when it talks about facility structures and plumes it says visual impacts of uh facility structures and plumes including but not limited to changes in landscape character or quality which are certain aspects of visual impacts that's clear as smud <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any problem with the heads are handling. We're all good. Okay. Um, and then finally, uh, we just had a couple um, scrutiny errors, corrections that uh, Councilmember Jenkins uh, proposed that we uh, have incorporated into um, the amended rules, or that we we would we think should be included into the amended notice. Um, which are listed here. So there's just removal, removals and surplus words, correcting a few typos. Um, that's normally the kind of thing that uh, the council rules allow staff to make without your approval, but we just want to throw it in here. Okay. Um, okay, so to kind of conclude, 
our recommendation is that council authorize staff to convene a fiscal impact advisory committee. Um, our recommendation is that the council invite all persons who commented on the June 1st notice to participate on that committee. Um, that does not mean we expect everybody to actually attend and appear. Um, that would just be the pool of invitees. Um, we, after we have that committee meeting, uh, we're asking council for authorization to issue an amended notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, that amended notice, a draft of that amended notice has been provided as attachment three. Um, we may make changes to the fiscal impact statement part of that notice uh, based on the feedback we get from the committee uh, if staff gives us that authorization. Um, and then once we issue the notice, there'd be a public comment period for 20 days. Um, so I did send you a comment we received uh, last night um, about our proposal. And specifically, there was a uh, concern that using the commenter group would not create a representative committee. Um, in particular, they were concerned about including just public commenters that didn't necessarily have specialized knowledge um, about uh, fiscal impacts. Um, if the council wanted to have a more targeted group, um, we could exclude some of the commenters. Um, the council could, of course, add other people. I do want to note that in that comment, the the, um, the person who was New Sun Energy, they they said, you know, we need to have uh, small businesses, local governments, uh, energy developers, environmental considerations, um, and maybe other groups included. Um, those groups and interests are pretty well represented by the commenters that we got, and these are people that have already express interest and been participating. The one group that maybe we're missing is local governments, but um, I don't think local, one local governments just haven't been participating in this rulemaking, haven't raised any concerns about fiscal impacts to them. Um, and don't we don't think they would really be affected by this rule in a meaning, meaningful, or in a direct way at least. Um, we could invite uh, Association of Oregon Counties or, or someone else along if the council wanted us to. Um, uh, and then if the council did want to you know, limit the public participants, we could we could extend this invitation to everybody except for the people that commented through that, that online platform. Um, but I personally think that, that those people were interested they represent local communities, they have local knowledge, and you know, we have trouble getting members of the public to come to these kind of meetings. So sending an invitation out to 70 people probably isn't gonna result in 70 people coming to this meeting. Um, and if they did, this part is good for them. Yeah. I am not in favor of, um, cause that's almost like, hey, I let them play, but now you can't come play. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a terrible yeah. image. Um, I would say that if, if magically you end up with that you want to participate, then you know maybe you have there's an opportunity to have some kind of discussion on what you do or you tee things up. But I am not in favor of now withdrawing initial participation. Right. Yeah, this is how I don't see the industry. Um, well, so New Sun Industry is a a solar developer. The Oregon Solar and Storage Industries Association is. The industry's association representing the interest most likely to be affected by these rules since solar is what we're seeing the most of. Renewable Northwest is a renewable advocacy group, but their interests are often represent the renewable energy industry as well. Um, there are no public utilities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, public utilities will not have much to say about the small business impact statement, but they could provide an impact on the fiscal impact statement more generally. So we could include Idaho Power. Oh, well, there's an error on this side because Idaho Power did comment, so they, they Oh, okay. And this is just, this is Marcy, my opinion. When you start getting into the utilities, this is the world, and I would expect them to have they know the process, they know how to be engaged. I don't feel like we have to do extra work to engage them. So I'm not concerned about them. What I would say is 
maybe they're part of it. It's like in my mind, where's the chambers of commerce type people? Like those are that's a and again, they wouldn't follow our rule, but the the um that's where I think OCA and some of those places should be. If you're gonna say small businesses and go to small businesses otherwise, I think you're just yeah. So well, I'm I'm more concerned about balance. You know, this is where's these most of these folks are gonna advocate for small business. Uh, and yet our definition of small business doesn't really include site certificate applicants. And so you know, these aren't site certificate applicants generally. That is correct. And and we could invite if you if you would like us to invite other applicants, like the big ones like up and greater next era. Um, I mean, there's probably others that I'm not thinking of right now. Um, we we could send this out to that pool as well. Um, uh, Obsidian was specifically referenced as, uh, you know, a small business that could potentially be affected. Although we don't agree. They, they did they meet. comment? Uh, Obsidian did not comment on this rulemaking. So yeah, this is again, this is Marcy. For me, this is their their wheel. This is what they do. They did not participate in. That's just strange to me that developers who obviously been engaged with Obsidian over the last several years that they would not have participated. I I don't have a lot of um, concern about this because that's what they do for you. Live. It's the 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 average the ranchers and the farmers and the people who don't sit down at the computer all day and track these things because that's not their job. For those developers that is their job. And they know the definition of small business. That's probably why they didn't participate. Yeah. Go ahead, Cindy. Oh, so I guess that's my, I'm, I'm a little bit confused by the uh, conversation with respect to applicants being the parent company, which is clearly not a small business, commenting on the applicant who is an LLC that at least in some, there aren't any, even any employee, employees. So, so I'm a little bit confused what they would, what the uh, parent companies would add, you know, for an invitation, you know, if they were invited. So the, the fiscal impact statement does have two components. I mean, one is just a general statement, which we provided and, and we did estimate how we think these rules would affect certificate holders and applicants. Um, the second part is like specific to small businesses. And as we, you'll see in the amended notice, we basically say if there was a small business, a hypothetical small business that applied, the impacts would be the same. Um, and I guess I kind of honed in on those small, that impact to small business. And to me, the Oregon Solar and Storage Industries and Renewable Northwest, I don't know who all the members are, but they're likely to be those small business applicants, I would think. And this is Mercy, I would say, as individuals and the people who are affected to do work, they probably would be. Yeah. Yeah. And we can, you know, if we invite, OCA to participate. Um, it has been, you know, their executive director and staff that have been the most active, but we could, you know, ask them to bring along one of their members or if they can. Yeah, and that, I was going to say that, it, you know, not necessarily that the invitation go out to the Oregon Solar Association Renewable Northwest, for instance, but they, them and their members, you know, so chance for the, for an individual if they want to participate in an individual company. Well, and yeah. not, sorry, this is Marcy, and I think we have to not lose sight of what the rulemaking is, is to start. That's where I think it goes off the rails. I mean, we're talking about senior resources and recreation standards rulemaking, not oh. Oh. just if I sit there and go otherwise, I'm going to say, well, I should be getting every electrical contractor and Oregon to say, because they are small businesses. You know, we could go, we could make this a big mess as we're trying to do the right thing. So I don't want to do that. Um, and if, if I may, one additional consideration is that this is who we're proposing to send the invites out to. We'd also have to do public notice because it's a public meeting. Um, 
whether or not we wish to allow other people who show up at the meeting to participate is kind of that's more of a discretionary choice. Um, I personally, I mean, I kind of feel like it's depends on on what what the the audience looks like being if there's you know if, if all seventy seven commenters show up, we would likely not going to allow other people to participate. But if we have a group of five and, and two people who two two members of industry or other people show up that that were not on our specific invite list, like there's nothing sit at the table and participate in the comment. Um, the important thing is that there's the committee and we ask them the question about this one tax uh, and consider their advice. Um, and this is Marcy and by the public notice being there, that doesn't think is it just the meeting or they can still submit comments. Um, on the on fiscal the impact statement that's included in the amended notice. Um, uh, it would be more limited. Um, often we do have a like public comment period at these kind of advisory committee meetings where people that weren't a designated member of the committee can kind of say, well, this is my recommendation. Um, I guess that's what I'm yeah. asking is if, if there's still, if, you know, so you said, okay, we want to not have every person from every actual people could still comment on the specifics of what we're discussing yeah. by having the mere fact there's a public thing. Yeah. That's all yeah. I'm saying. I just want to be clear that there's an opportunity. It may not be the desired opportunity because you're not sitting at the table or on Zoom, but there's still a for people to provide their feedback on the specific issue at hand. Thank you, Chair Go. Yeah, I think that's accurate. And then I, I will just add that also if we once we issue the amended notice, that is a full public comment period and there's no limitation on the comments that, that people can submit. Yes, Cindy. Uh, quick question, Cindy Condon. Um, for the advisory committee, do we do you set the size? You know, like we're, we're send out this invitation, but it gets unwieldy after you know with more than seven people or right. Do you set the size? So typically, yes. Um, and what we would normally do for like a regular rules advisory committee. Yeah, oh, well, I think what they could practice is anyways, and this is what we're recommending for the amended rule, amendment rulemaking that we're talking about later, is that we would solicit interest, have people give us, you know, tell us whether they want to participate uh, and what, you know, give us some basic information about what interest they, they, they why they're interested or what their qualifications are. Uh, and then we would come back to you and say, here's the pool of people who express interest, you know, we want you to pick a representative group out of this pool. Um, here's our recommendation. You know, do you have any changes? In this case, since we're on a, I mean, it's kind of a tight time frame. Um, we don't really have. I mean, we could send out conceivably a, a request for interest today. Uh, say you have to let us know by next Wednesday so we have enough time to get the notice out for the actual meeting, uh, and then you would have to authorize staff to make the decision on who gets included or not, um, unless we, uh, you want us to come back at the November meeting and, and you know, we, we obviously, we can spread this out as, as long as you want, if you want to be more involved and, and all that, you, you could, but um, for getting this in front of you for December, uh, we're kind of saying we have this pool that have kind of self-selected and express interest. Um, let's just use them, invite them. Um, if if we happen to get 50 people show up, I, I would consider that to be a good thing. And, you know, uh, it makes my job as a facilitator harder and, and I'll have that up from Tom. Or, you know, if it looks too hairy, I might just make him do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I think we can manage the expectations or manage the group to, to, to get the input we need to get out of it. Um, in this case, but typically, yeah, you would say we want 12 people. Here's the 12 people we want. Brian, just to be clear, 50 people may give comment, yeah. but that advisory committee is there's 12 yeah. chairs at the table. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. So, are you saying that the department should select 12 people out of 
whoever responds to the notice. That was my. That was what I thought was going to happen is that you wouldn't have 50 people on an advisory committee. I think the recommendation is for 50 people on advisory. Well, if, if I may direct the talk on it, the request is that we would just solicit, you know, from the group of those people who provided comment. And then anybody who responded and said, yes, I want to be on that, that we would allow them to participate on the, the fiscal impact advisory committee. Whether that's five or 30, we figured there's probably going to be some self-selected and there's not going to be 50 people. I mean, it's possible, but not likely. So there's probably going to be, you know, not a tremendous number of people. I, you know, based on past experience, you know, I think we would be lucky to get 10 people to show up if we if we send a notice out to 77 or more people. I was in no way thinking 30 people would be on the advisory committee, but that was- Yeah, typically concern. not, no. Okay. You know, yeah, possible. If, if, yeah, that's my concern. Yeah. You know, with today's computer age, you know, you get yeah. an organization that says you need to go, you need to participate in this so that we can dominate the advisory right. committee. You know, I'm, I'm after balance here. Well, that's why I was thinking the discretion of staff to say these are the intro, these are the commenters, and these are the people who, so there's a funneling that you have a workable advisory committee. Yeah. If that's just what I was thinking. Sure. And, I think it just, it requires the extra step of being able to tell people what their ability to participate in before the meeting. And so like, since it's so compressed, I, I think that gets challenging, but, but what we can do just like a public hearing is, you know, day of a lot more people show up, we can say, well, unfortunately we, we had this great, you know, turnout, uh, but now everybody's kind of more limited in the time they can, they can have to provide their comments. Yeah, and, and then we would articulate, you know, even if we had sort of more of a dominant side, you know, and they all you know, said the same thing, we would make that representation so council understood that as well. So I'm going to be the jerk now. Can we get to the point where we need to do our action because we need to take a break soon? <laughs> and um, so. um, yeah, I can conclude and, and you can finish your discussion or deliberation. Um, this is just, I just want to point out to do this and get this before you in September with a 20 day comment period and giving you a week, uh, to, uh, review comments. Um, we would need to have the committee done and, uh, get the amended notice out by the 18th, like I said before, and, um, I, I am going to be on vacation for. Uh, quite a bit of the time in between now and then. Um, so I think we'd be looking at a committee meeting on like the 15th or 16th of November. Um, so we'd like to just say, here's the day, whoever can be there, please be there. Um, and maybe we'll touch base with a few of the key stakeholders before then to make sure they're available. Um, okay, so that's, yeah, that that is everything I have to say. Uh, we, um, have the options before you uh, for the motion. I'm trying to think if we made any big changes. Uh, the council did make the one change to uh, the definition of protected areas. Um, and we need your final decision on which way you want to go with the goalpost language. Um, and then your final decision on whether or not you want to go forward with the um, advisory committee. I, I, I think uh, I'll defer to the council secretary on how specific your motion needs to be, but I think those are the three decisions I'd, I'd like from you. Or I, 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 sure. it's the same way. I think we need to do this as two separate motions um, because I do think we need to Continue uh, the amendment process for the changes that we have recommended. I don't support fiscal committee and fiscal impact advisory committee. So I'd like to see us do as two separate motions. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Marcy, uh, Todd, is that so? Can say yes. 
make sure I don't get us in trouble. So um, in order to do that, um, do we need specific language, uh, anything different than we have available? So let me give you a second. So if the first one is the uh, amended notice removing the fiscal impact uh, advisory committee, then the way I have it, and we can, we can make reference to, let's see, I have three sort of sets of changes. One would be uh, the def definition of protected area under sub I, and that was the federal um, as articulated. Uh, I don't know if we need to be super specific because uh, that was articulated. Um, Chris got that down. So we can kind of I can package that up later on. Uh, the goalpost option, so either option one or option two, and then the Scrivener error uh, changes that were also included. Yeah, so Councilman, if I can clarify too, if you take action on the recommendation for the fiscal impact advisory committee and you decide against that, you would be moving directly into the adoption of the amendments because we can't issue a, a permanent. We, I don't think we can issue an amended notice uh, without the committee, but you can adopt rules if you don't think that committee is one. I'm not sure I understood that, Christopher. So we're, I don't think anyone is proposing that we adopt rules today. Okay. Yeah. I think what we're proposing are two different motions. One would be for the fiscal impact analysis committee uh, or not. What, whether or not to do that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then if you don't do that, we, we don't really have a way to issue an amended notice. That, that is a prerequisite for issuing that, an amended notice with an amended fiscal and back statement to cure errors in the fiscal notice. So, so you could say no, and you could not take action now. We could, uh, we could just issue a new notice, but that would require 49 days instead. Oh, I see. Then we're going to need the 23rd. Which is okay too, but um, maybe it'd be gone. <laughs> Dream on there, buddy. Yeah. And there's, if we did not, if we issued a new notice without having a committee meeting, then we we could have the same objections to this one box again. Yeah. If, yeah. So then we gain that. So. Yeah. Well, the way even more. So now this, this is the shortest option. And if we're not ready to make a decision today. Well, team, what do we want to do? So there is a motion in here already, but you've got some amendments to it. Uh, yeah, there are talk on that. So the, um, you know, the, the points that were discussed uh, in the actual rule language, uh, those were, I, I think, I'm looking to Chris because you know, I'm not clearly tracking all of this as well as they probably should be. So would that even be part of the motion as well? Do they need to make reference to the changes that were discussed today? Or is that even not necessary at this point? Um, if we're going to issue the amended notice and it's been changed, yeah, I would say just with the, with the, the changes discussed today, and that's sufficient. So it's a second. Yeah. yeah. And so again, yeah. the, the, the sort of, these are fairly generic, but the, you know, the definition of protected area under sub I, the federal, the, you know, there was two options under the goalpost, first and the second one, first being is more of a reference and the second being like the full duplication of the language and then the Scrivener errors, which are on the slide. Yes, please. Okay, this can. Uh, Madam Chair, I move the Council approve staff's request for authorization to convene a fiscal advisory committee made up of persons who com commented on the notice of proposed rulemaking and authorize staff to issue an amended notice of proposed rulemaking as, as recommended uh, changes that were added today. Which includes federal I. Option one and the scriptures. Yes, as legal with this. Councilor Duncan, 
just said. Yep. And I'll suck some. Yep. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Hang on, we've got. Are we good? Under now? discussion? Yeah. Do we have a discussion? I would say, I was asking Chris about global government and whether they had commented on the rule package. And my understanding is they did not. And so it doesn't mean that you have to have the, the way that motion is drafted yeah. is, is, is local government wouldn't be invited to part, even be invited to participate in the fiscal impact advisory committee because they had not commented. Probably they didn't comment because they're not interested. Yeah. But I just want to make sure you understand that the way that motion is drafted, they would not be invited. Yeah. So if I were if you to want to say invite association or, or, or some other local government. You can. So if it said to convene a fiscal advisory committee made up of persons who commented on the notice of proposed real gains and invite the yeah. associate association, association in Oregon County to participate as they choose. choose. I got it. Okay. Seem like good clarification. So we have a little modified uh, motion and the seconds that any further discussion. Christopher, so they're going to do they need to specify option 1 or 2 on the. Um, we did. And I did. did. I did that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It was option. Great. That's good. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to say it. Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Hanley Jenkins. Oh. This is hard. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say yes. Ken Howe. Yes. Cindy Connell. Yes. Marcy Gray. Yes. Motion carries, Madam Chair. Holy moly. Thank you. Christopher, I don't even know what to say to you. Yeah. Um, that yeah. was um, an exercise of, well, anyway, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> <a great> difficulty. <laughs> thank you, Millie. Uh, well done. Um, and to uh, all of us, I, you know, we often get accused of not commenting and discussing. I think we have exceeded that threshold well beyond yeah. anything. So um, I do think just for fairness, because we're so off track, if we could do the public comment period and then take a break, that would be Jeez. awesome. <laughs> but we're going to hold our breath because we only have one person <laughs> in the room. Are there people? Anyway, let me, are you guys okay with doing that and then taking sure. a break? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next item is agenda. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Mr. Uh Is agenda item C the public comment period? This is an information item. This time is reserved for the public to address the council regarding any item within council jurisdiction that is not otherwise closed for comment. Items closed for comment include the board to Hemingway transmission line proposed order and proposed contested case order, the Nolan Hills proposed order. Protected areas, scenic resources, and recreation resources standards rulemaking, and the perennial wind chaser station proposed final retirement plan. Whew. So, um, we have any commenters? No comment. Madam Chair, nobody in the room. No one <laughs> in the room wishing a comment. Nancy, do we have any on the phone? Okay. Nancy, do you want to review the options again of how people do make those comments? Sure. This point I see this. Okay. Uh, so phone call matters if you would like to press star three to raise your hand to make a comment. Press star three to lower your hand happily. Webinar, just cover your hand over your, over your mouse over your game. And then... Madam Chair, if I may, since Nancy is so far from the microphone, which is here, I'll just repeat that. So, Thank you. Uh, if you're participating by WebEx, you should be able to find the little raise your hand icon by hovering your, your mouse over that to raise your hand. Um, if you are on the phone, please press star three. I do have my big car there on this camera, so I'm going to go ahead and only 
Okay, thank you. Am I, am I, am I recognized? Yes, please go ahead. So, Mike MacArthur, Executive Director of the Community Renewable Energy Association. Is my audio all right? I'm hearing some feedback. No, oh, we can hear you fine. Go ahead, okay. Mike. Um, Community Renewable Energy Association is an intergovernmental association whose regular membership consists of units of local government, such as cities, counties, sports, and irrigation districts. Korea also has ex officio members who are non governmental organizations, private businesses um, who are developers of renewable energy. Um, thank you for uh, including local government. We have not been participating directly in this process. Um, even though we represent most of the counties where this development is happening uh, in Eastern Oregon, um, we, we all, all share memberships with Renewable Northwest, Oregon Solar and Storage in, in Association, and New Sun is also a member of Korea. But in this case, I believe that actual local government needs to be represented in the, phys, in the <clears throat> fiscal um, impact uh, advisory committee directly. I've contacted the Association of Oregon Counties of whom we're an associate. And so I would encourage um, the committee to include either Korea or the Association of Counties on this advisory committee, because we definitely believe that there are physical impacts to local governments. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Oh, admit, let me also add that I su we support new sons letter that you received last night. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments? Commenters? At this time, there are no other comments. Thank you. We're going to take a final call if anyone would like to comment during this public comment period. We are closing the final comment period at 1117. Thank you. All right, Grant. We are recessing for 10 minutes. Let go. Uh, please return at 11.30. We're giving you 13 minutes instead. How about that? Okay, guys, I shut the recording on.